Hey folks, this is Lyle. In 2023, I'm going on tour to do my Therapy Gecko podcast live in several cities across the US, UK, Europe, Australia, and Canada. Click the link in the description to sign up for my email list and get notified when tickets go on sale. Okay, let's get into the episode. Anthony Fantano. Lyle. How's life? It's going pretty good. Good. What's going good about it today? I'm excited to be here. I'm excited, excited to, to be here. here. I'm excited to be in a different place. Mm-hmm. Excited to take some time this weekend to hang out with some content creators Mm -hmm. that I enjoy. I don't Mm -hmm. often get the chance to do that. Mm -hmm. I sort of live in the sticks Mm -hmm. mostly and just kind of keep to myself and my albums. Mm -hmm. Have you always been like that? Like kind of kept to yourself? Um, I've had, I've had a very small circle of friends, Okay, you know, over the years. Has that been like an intentional thing? Um, I, I'd, I'd say it was more just by just, just the way things panned out. I okay. think just kind of having a little social anxiety and just very niche interests yeah. in, in a place where like, you know, that, that, is, that isn't necessarily like a hotbed of music culture, mm-hmm. sort of like, you know, inevitably puts you in that place where you're probably mm-hmm. not going to be commiserating with a whole lot of people mm-hmm. often. Is, is music like, I mean, is, is music the main thing that kind of connects you to other people? Um, it's definitely one of the main things. Okay. It can be. Okay. I mean, I, I think a lot of that has changed over the years. Okay. My, my friend circle these days is a lot bigger and wider and better and healthier than it's been in the past. When you were a kid, like in middle school and high school, did you have a lot of friends? Um, no, again, I would say like a handful of close friends. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew a lot of people and was friendly with a lot of people, but mm-hmm. in terms of like people I considered myself close with, those probably few and far between. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And like now that you're, like you said, like kind of living, like doing your own thing, how often... Do you, or if ever, do you get a, a little hit of like, I should go out into the universe? Much more often. Okay. I, you know, I, I would say maybe at least like every other week or at least once a week. What do you think is, is the main catalyst of that that ping to want to make you leave the house and go do things? I, I think um, there's a couple of things. I mean, it was definitely like maybe hitting an emotional rock bottom due to, the, due to isolation that was happening in the pandemic. Yeah. But then also... I would say it had to do with, you know, another realization as a result of that coming by way of just kind of realizing how how few people I was kind of connected with in a personal way and how much that was kind of to my own detriment. Yeah. And wasn't really helping me out of I was in a bit of a depression for yeah. a period of time and just sort of like lack of access to a wide variety of people to kind of give me perspective on what was happening and what I was going through did 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 me a lot of disservice. Yeah. Yeah, I um, sometimes it's hard because like, I don't know if you get this way where like you hang out with a lot of people and that can make you have like a weird depression and then you isolate and you have weird depression and you have you got to like balance the two. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think like, you know, you want to have a you want to have a, a wide, healthy amount of deep, satisfying relationships. Yeah. You don't want a, an overabundance of surface level relationships yeah. because that that can be isolating, too. Mm hmm. You know, and, and I, I try not to, you know, um, basically like overload myself with, with too many of those, you know, if, if something's not really kind of going that deep or yeah. isn't really kind of mutually satisfying or, or whatever, um, you know, I, I tend to just sort of focus more on the things that are working instead. What kinds of people do you like find yourself drawn to personally? I, I, re- I really don't know the type. It's just yeah. really kind of like, you know, I, I, guess, I guess I guess I I trend toward openness. Okay. If you could be open yeah. with me in the way that I can be open with you, then I right. think there's like, you know, cause for continuing to communicate. If you're closed off and you're not sharing and maybe you're even closed minded, mm-hmm. I feel like there's only so far that can that can go. Do you not like talking about yourself? No, I, I do, but yeah. with, with select people. Okay. I actually love talking about myself and things that I'm experiencing and going through. But again, in select context and with select people. Sure. There are certain sure, friends sure, sure. that I have that will send each other 20, 30 minute voice notes. Really? Yeah. What? Of just, what? of just stuff we're going through. Yeah. 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 It actually kind of like in, in a way, I mean, I do go to therapy, actual therapy. Yeah. 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 Um, not just this kind of therapy. Yeah. yeah but yeah. I mean, you know those 
types of conversations and connections with people who actually kind of matter in your life are, are very therapeutic in their own way too they are they are it's it's uh hard i guess when you like are interacting with so many people on the internet and like especially if you're like a plugged in guy mm -hmm. like really comprehending that people like it's a weird type of relationship that people like don't know you you don't really know them but there's like a but they feel like they know you yeah yeah it's weird sometimes i'll like um you know find myself talking about myself on my stream and like almost using it like th therapeutically mm -hmm. in that way it's like mm -hmm. a, a a mutual benefit type of thing i think that's good and i think given the community and the brand that you've built it makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, it, I think it's a good thing. I mean, you, you literally built your brand about sharing your feelings and being open with them. Yeah. And, and not that I've necessarily built my brand in antithesis to that. You mm -hmm. know, it just so happens that in my line of work, there's a lot of animosity toward me yeah. just for having different opinions yeah. from other people. And I found that over the 10 plus years that I've done mm -hmm. this, the more people sort of know about me personally even yeah. if it does come from a vulnerable place and yeah. it maybe is well received at the point at which i share it uh, there's always going to be individuals who will come back around and use that against me yeah whenever like you know i'm giving an opinion or saying something that they disagree with oh well this is just because this happened to you or this is just because you know you think this or this is just yeah. because you think that and it's like no i mean maybe you assume that because you only know three things about me is the outside end of that, that that i review music but. how genuine like the animosity yeah. that you receive how genuinely hostile is it because when you're talking about like music opinions i would assume it's kind of like how like different people like their football teams get into arguments right. but they don't like actually fucking hate each other you know to, like, mean, to what degree do you experience the animosity being sincerely it, hostile it, it ranges like i mean I don't want to get into too much detail because I feel like sometimes when you talk about these things and sort of like bring them up, it, it tends to incentivize more psychopaths to kind of engage in the same behavior. But it yeah. ranges from a tweet where it's like, hey, you suck. I fucking hate you to yeah. things that if I knew where the person lived who did what they did, they yeah. could be criminally charged. Oh, OK. Okay. For, for attempting what they attempted to do. That's that's pretty hostile. Yeah. So, yeah. It, again, it ranges. And, you know, it's like I never know which one I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, the things that, you know, have been to the extreme are mm -hmm. very, very few mm -hmm. and far between to the mm -hmm. point where I'm not necessarily, like, fearing for my life or anything. Do you have but, any part of you that enjoys playing, like, a heel role of any kind, um, even if it's a slight thing? I'm like, I, I'm just unapologetic about it. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say I get off on it. At the, at the end of the day, I get the most satisfaction out of if I love something and maybe it's not something a lot of people have heard about yeah. and I get the opportunity to turn other people onto it mm -hmm. and then maybe it creates kind of a fanfare or sensation or passion for that artist and mm -hmm. then maybe they're able to go on and continue making their art in a way that they wouldn't have been able to otherwise because they wouldn't have had that mm -hmm. fan base you so know? you like to like yeah more than no i love to you like. love to like yeah okay yeah. but you also but you also want to be honest i also want to be honest and i also kind of want to at least to a degree because i see what i do is sort of like you know it's it's in service of the audience at the end of yeah. the day and you know, there's going to be albums that they want me to review that I'm just not that into, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it used to be that when I started my YouTube channel and kind of started the needle drop in general, I only reviewed and talked about things that I enjoyed mm -hmm. and, you know, and that worked for a while, but then eventually came a time where either people were like, well, what do you think about this? And it's kind of a really big release. You can't necessarily ignore it. Or maybe a really bad record comes from an mm -hmm. artist that you liked in the past. You mm -hmm. know, you're just not going to, like everything all the time yeah you know yeah. and and sort of going completely silent on extremely relevant record a or artist who has maybe been one of your mainstays b you know doesn't really look all that good in terms of like you know your audience trusting you or having faith in right. you to kind of give right. you give your give your you know view honestly what's been the most persistent thought on your mind lately um just just maintaining my own mental stability and prioritizing my own happiness what do you what do you do to maintain mental stability um eat right exercise yeah spend time with people who care about me yeah 
I think my, my resolution for this year is, has, has been, if you're adding to my life, I'm adding you to my life. If you're subtracting from it, you're getting subtracted from my life. I want to know, like, would you consider yourself like, like a workaholic or like you like really definitely so like is there's a weird thing I think when you're in that position where like you think that peace is attained from doing the best you can all the time at the work Hmm. and then like. It's actually when you, I wouldn't, I haven't done this yet, but when you slow down and start to take care of yourself, that's what people tell me is when you start to actually feel that happiness that you think you're going to achieve by being a workaholic. Mm-hmm. Have you experienced that? I'm, I'm pretty good about my physical health okay. as much as possible. It's, it's really sort of like that, that lack of social ability that sometimes I'm not as conscious of as I should be, which mm-hmm. again, I've been a lot better about, mm-hmm. but I mean, as far as the workaholic stuff, my mom is the same way. Really? Like she's just recently retired and her retirement plan at least as of late um has been to she's an account by trade uh is to start her own accounting business Mm. (laughs) which she's always done it on the side but now she's like well now i'm just gonna do it like you know uh more than just part-time or at least like you know nearly full-time or whatever so it's like you know she's definitely somebody who works quite a bit at at what she does where do you where do you see yourself when you're like retired and retirement well, yeah age. that's that's what i'm thinking like i i don't know if i want to be there like i feel like when i retire i do actually want to retire yeah. however it's like uh i still want to spend time doing things that i like i guess the problem is that whenever i'm doing an activity i enjoy i tend to get so passionate about it that the amount of effort i put into it becomes, becomes work. work yeah yeah, yeah. whether yeah. that be like maybe if i decided to well i'm just gonna make music Right. You know, if, if I decide my retirement plan was I'm just going to make music for fun, I probably would end up focusing on it to the point where it would just become work. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, um, recently a fun thing that I've been getting into is I've been doing indoor rock climbing stuff. Okay. And, you know, I mean, it's it's cool and it's not. I mean, part of the reason that it's cool is like the fact that it is such a strenuous physical activity causes me to sort of take it in chunks and bites. Yeah. But simultaneously, like... I did like slightly injure myself going to the gym like three days back to back to back. Or you you should get every yourself, so for like, all every time you like engage with a thing, it ultimately right. becomes like a, an obsession. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I I definitely have like a you know when something is like a new interest, I have like a kind of a fiery passion for it, and I mm-hmm. want to dive into it and sort of like go like go hard, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know. And I do have to you know sort of like like again with the rock climbing stuff like I, I i've been doing better lately about sort of like going only maybe a few days a week and kind of just taking the progress slowly as it comes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah i tend to like speed run everything you tend to speed run everything yeah like I, like whenever i'm crazy or passionate about something i have to learn to do it or learn about it as fast as i possibly can why do you think you tend to speed run everything uh, cause I have ADHD and I hyper focus on shit. And this, that's been a thing for your like whole, like, can you, re- can you remember from like childhood, like yeah, any, time, anything like, that you video games. Okay. Yeah. But like in, into adulthood, it's different stuff. Okay. But uh, I've, I've only been diagnosed as recently as 36. So Th- this... I, I've only been aware of it yeah. for a short amount of time recently. This tendency to speed run, has it manifested itself primarily in positive ways or negative ways i'd say both yeah i mean the positive way is that i inadvertently built my entire life around the one thing that i could obsess over right endlessly right for hours and hours and hours right with little to no break then what's the negative you, you lose track of time mm-hmm. you you know sort of like forget to prioritize certain things that you probably should be prioritizing what do you what do you think is the most important thing in your life like the most important kind of avenues run that question by me um like the most important avenues in your life what is a priority to you um at at this point i would say like uh i mean obviously my work but you know it's it's not so much just for the effort of enjoying it or getting anything out of it personally but it's more like how can this sort of like serve the goals of myself and my loved ones long term so that everybody's mm. sort of like cool and like mm. taken care of any mm-hmm. if anybody needs anything mm-hmm. you know like mm-hmm. that's kind of where the focus is with that right your long term thinking and and also just kind of making sure that i'm good and i'm healthy and i'm taken care of so that i have the yeah. energy and the focus and the everything to be able to continue to do it and are you feeling as though you're doing a good job lately at achieving those goals 
So you're qualified so. to talk to callers about how they might also achieve what is going on with them. If that's the question, if no, that, if no, that's no, a I'm question. Just, no, no, no. I don't think. Uh, uh, I think. I think we're qualified to sit here in gecko costumes and talk to strangers from the internet. Yeah, I think so. Would you like to do that? I would love to do that. Hello, Ryan. Hi, how's it going? Ryan, where are you right now? I'm in my car right now. I'm trying to get to a, to a, to a parking spot so I can talk to you better. Yeah, talk to us safely, Ryan. Where I'm, are you on your uh, way to? I'm, very, I'm, uh, I'm just going to drive to the nearest grocery store. I'm just trying to get out of my apartment at the moment so I can talk to you in some privacy. Is something going out of the apartment? Um, well, my ex-girlfriend is there right now, and Oof. I'm just trying to avoid that situation. So why are you still living with your ex? Um, so we've been together for six years, hmm. and uh, she's, she seems to think that we just need therapy, and we'll get better, and problems happen but i'm i'm feeling that we've had too many issues and the issues just continue to happen uh we're just kind of growing apart but Mm -hmm. we uh just we discovered this about two months into uh re-signing another year lease so uh we're we're still tied up in that okay um I don't want to, you know, have you put words in the mouth of your ex because obviously you can't necessarily speak to things from her perspective, but, you know, from your own point of view, what are your points of disagreement or contention that make you feel like even if we do go to therapy, this isn't going to work? Like what in your mind is the unsolvable problem that isn't going to change that, you know, that, that it only makes sense to walk away from at this point? Yeah, um, so I guess it's more along the lines of I I don't feel I can continue to build trust um, with her. Uh, for the last three or so years, she's been pretty sick. Um, mm-hmm. And so she lost a lot of weight. She wasn't working. And I was kind of having to take care of her, myself, and our dog all by, my, all by myself. Um, and in, instead of her spending that time, like, fully bettering herself, uh, she was getting attention from other guys and spending her time doing that. And I just, I, I don't feel that I can get back to a place where I, I trust that she won't do that in the future. Has, in talking to her about this, has she tried to change behavior has she shown remorse has she you know do you feel like any kind of openness from her on this topic specifically we, we don't need to go to other things that you feel like are maybe you know huge issues like you know is, is there anything that she's given you in terms of like a hint of like you know this will change if we do this or do that or stick with this in some way or do this kind of therapy um yes but it, it's happened in in the past. The same the same kind of answers and the same changes happen. Um, so I, I just see it as like a big pattern at this point. Um, okay, so it's, it's a pattern. Nice now and yeah, yeah, it's a pattern. It's the straw that breaks the camel's back. It, you know, you're feeling like this is something that will continue to go on. I mean, um, I, I I guess I would consider getting back into it if you felt like there was some kind of sign of a sea change in behavior but if you feel like you're just getting this the same kind of rundown over again that you've gotten in the past uh maybe it is time to sort of begin to call things off and just kind of you know go uh your own way there's there's nothing wrong with walking away from something that you've invested a lot of time in i feel like that is learning that's growth at the end of the day that's you how old were you when you started this relationship i was 18 yeah, you're 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 six years older now. You're deeper into your twenties. You have a better sense and understanding of yourself than you did at eighteen. And on top of that, 
what are personally your standards or desires or wants or goals out of life and a romantic relationship are com- are completely changed. Most people, when they start relationships when they're teenagers, are, whether they like it or not, are, are fucking around and learning the rules of the road when it comes to relationships. You're at a point now where you have a better sense of who you are and what you want, and it's okay to reach a point where you're like, I, I no longer want this. This is no longer working for me. Gotcha. Okay. Um, is, and then to go along... Sorry, here. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, to go along with that, um, I've been trying to kind of distance myself and open up. Um, and I just... I feel completely out of place not giving her or somebody like my complete focus um hmm. I, I feel super weird going to the grocery store alone i feel weird hmm. uh going to the gym alone I, I i don't feel comfortable like being alone and so it's hmm. that's what's making the situation even tougher because so, i don't so you want guys you guys would like do everything get, together yeah pretty much like i okay. didn't hmm. focus on anything besides her if we were doing well, a hobby i feel like is it, is it wouldn't that make together. this you know is is i i understand that there's there's a fear to that but there's also an excitement at this new opportunity that you have to go out and build that skill which is a skill that you cannot live without right Re- really an incentive honestly like you know we, we we've reached the point where i mean even without any kind of confirmation from Lyle or I, it, it, it sounds like you kind of already have it in your mind that this is not working and that you don't want to continue to keep pushing this. And honestly, um, that's bad in its own way. As you've just kind of posed here in so many words, how it's bad in another way is that you're potentially putting yourself at a disservice or you're doing yourself a disservice by not allowing yourself to grow that independence you know, that I, I feel like everybody sort of needs to find in their own way as they transition out of their teens into their 20s. And, you know, this could be an opportunity to do that as well. Ryan, can I ask you if what about being alone is scary to you? Um, I, I everything kind of I. I enjoy being alone, like in my car. Because it's like a small space. Um, but if I'm like in the store, I feel like everybody is watching me and I'm just, mm. I'm going to mess up somehow. Mm. I mean, um, as you kind of transition, you know, assuming you do transition, you know, into a singlehood, there is going to be a degree to which you're just going to have to get used to that. But simultaneously, especially as you kind of work through such an emotionally trying time, there's nothing wrong with not wanting to be alone. I feel like that fear is natural and it's normal and it's rational, but there's a lot of ways to not be alone that don't involve continuing to engage in a relationship that you're not happy. In. Right. Right. There right. are friends, mm-hmm. there are family, mm-hmm. there are other romantic. You, you could just simply put yourself out there in the dating pool and date casually. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you could just be seeing people, on and off as you just sort of have time and see fit and that's fine and that's healthy and that's cool too you don't need to be in this uh intense toxic long-term relationship that's not working out for you in order to avoid loneliness there are other ways to connect Mm -hmm. with people that don't involve being in that context Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i agree i think you could benefit a lot from kind of broadening your your uh solutions to your to your loneliness problem is you know instead of just investing it all in you know, being in this relationship that's not working for you. And again, you know, specific, specifically, you know, in terms of the grocery store thing that you're talking about, you must know other people who also need food. You can go to the sure. grocery, you could do your grocery shopping as well with somebody who also goes to a grocery store in your area or a town over or whatever. You know, th- there's lots of ways to engage in these, uh, you know, activities uh, with somebody else to make them go by faster, make them more fun or just, you know, make them feel less isolating. How do you feel hearing all of this, Ryan? I feel like you've given me very good insight on the situation that I'm dealing with. Um, I, it, it's helped a lot so so far. I'm really uh, 
seeing seeing the light. Listen, before we go, where are you parked right now? Are you in like a? Are Walmart you at the grocery park? store? Uh, where are you right now? So I am parked at an abandoned Albertsons that sometimes turns into a, one of those Halloween stores. Spirit Halloween. Uh, nice. Yeah, yeah. It's but it's if, just if, a o- blank if only were October, you could get your Halloween shopping done. Yeah, that'd be a good. Yeah, uh, listen, go in there and grab yourself a Halloween costume, and that can be your first excursion out there by yourself into a store. I, I I'll go do that. I'll go to uh, Hot Topic or something, buy a costume. Ryan, is there anything good. else you want to say to the people at the computer before we go? Um, no, I'm I'm good. Thank you guys. Hey, take care, man. Love you, Ryan. How uh, have you? How are you with with? being alone um depending on you know i i'm definitely the type of person who uh like my social battery runs out sometimes yeah then i feel like i need a break yeah kind of need some isolation kind of yeah. need like a solo activity play some bass play some guitar play some violin something like yeah. that yeah. you know watch some silly internet videos you or, know or, or you know my work usually entails being alone so sometimes i'll just do that it's it's hard on this uh, podcast. I feel like we get so many like young people who are like very similar to Ryan, where it's like, you know, I was in this relationship when I was really young, and then you know, I don't know if it's still serving me. And they, it's a tough thing because then they get out, and then they have problems like just being alone, which is like a, a necessary skill. You know, I've had problems where like I. Um, I really pride myself on like being able to be out in the universe and go like I'll go on to like foreign countries alone and trips alone and I, I like doing that. But I, sometimes I feel as though my my pride in doing that, you know, it, there is a proclivity to it that can push you away from other people. Yeah. And I know that there's got to be a good balance between those things. Yeah, specifically in regards to the relationship thing, sometimes you have young people who are bouncing around from relationship relationship to relationship very volatile very in a very volatile fashion yeah and seemingly they can't even commit to anything mm-hmm. but then you have people who sort of like will commit to something really hard really mm-hmm. long term for maybe like the wrong reasons and you're ignoring red flags mm-hmm. and maybe you find yourself in a position where you're like saving the other person mm-hmm. and you know you're you're there more for their benefit than you are for your own you mm-hmm. know and there's no balance there and at, as you say like there has to be there has to be some kind of balance. You know, mm-hmm. we have to meet somewhere in the middle. We, you know, should commit to people who are willing to put in the time and care mm-hmm. about us and are emotionally invested in us. Like when we see a good thing, you know, in terms of like another person in our lives who's adding positive stuff, be it romantically or platonically, we should give that person time. We should give that person respect. Mm-hmm. We should, you know, mm-hmm. give that person whatever they need to be able to continue engaging with us and, you know, sort of like a healthy and positive way. Um, you know, but simultaneously, while committing can be good, you don't want to stick to something that's bad for you right. or bad for the other person either. Right, right. You know, I got a question for you. What? Why do you think virtually, or like almost all music, at least like when you look at like popular music, mm. it's all about love. It's yeah. all about sex and it's all about romance. Why do you think that is? I mean, in terms of the most popular music, I think, I mean, most popular music gets to the level that it does just based on its appeal. Yeah. You know, how widely it appeals. Right. And one of the most widely universal things things is romance. Literally transcends language. Right. Right. You know, like what it is to be in love. Sure. Cultures interpret these things differently. But in a lot of respects, what it means to be in love in California is you know, the same thing that it means to be in love in Dubai, Mm -hmm. you know, it's Mm -hmm. like there's, there's at least kind of universally uh, an understanding of what that feeling is to some degree. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, yeah, some of the most popular songs, pieces of music of all time are about being in love, Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. know, just because again, it's it's just such a powerful feeling. It's an Mm -hmm. intense feeling. Mm -hmm. Uh, Again, it's a universal feeling. And on top of it, most music that you see on the charts like yeah. it gets as popular as it does by appealing to young audiences and right. what uh, what demographic of people is more lovesick yes than, than at that point in their right, life right 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 than people who are like you know age 12 to 20 something right 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 know? i feel like uh, i don't know there, something to me makes me feel like there there's something about it makes me feel like young people will like rush into things just because there's this 
cultural sentiment that if you don't have romantic love in your life, it's like the number one thing. And, and it is very important. Thing, or it makes you a loser. Right. Or it makes you a loser. Or like, I mean, you know, like, you know, if you're not having sex, you're a loser. If you're not in love, you're a loser. You're not, you know, in some kind of romantic thing. And I don't know. Sometimes I've, I've gotten a feeling from talking to people that it, it will lead them you know, that kind of cultural notion will lead them to like, you know, like, like Ryan was like, be in things that aren't even working for right. them, you know? Yeah, it can. Yeah. I mean, that, that desire to s stick to something that may not even be good for you can come from a lot of places and, and that can definitely be one of them. Uh, let's talk to David from New York. Hello, David. Uh, hi there. You sound confused. You okay, David? Uh, I'm just, I'm just shocked to be on. How's it going? Good, good. How uh, how can we get you today, David? Um. Well, uh, I'm having a problem with my cousin and my family, um, okay. and I was hoping you could help resolve it. What's going on? Um. So my cousin and her husband are redoing their bathroom, and. Mm -hmm. One of the things that they need to change is their toilet. And so my cousin's husband goes to Home Depot. He checks out all the toilets. He picks out one that he thinks is good, whatever, comes back home. And uh, my cousin is like, did you sit on the toilet at Home Depot? And he says, no. And she gets frustrated with him because she's like, how could you buy a toilet that you didn't already sit on? Hmm. And my family's torn. We don't know how to feel about it. Well, dive, dive further into this. What is her philosophy behind this? Like, it's, is she mad because he didn't even test it to see if it felt good or something? Or Right, the idea that, like, why, you're bringing this toilet into your life that you're going to be using every day for several years. You should test it out before you make that big of a commitment. Is that correct? Pretty much, yeah. And uh, we ran it by family, and everyone was like, why would you sit on the toilet at the Home Depot? And I am on her side. I, I feel like you should try it out. I mean, because it is a non-functional toilet, there's only yes. so far that you could try it out. Yeah. Number one. Okay. Num number two, toilets are made to a pretty specific set of parameters, especially if you're buying the sort of contractor grade stuff that's at Home Depot. Mm -hmm. Like you, mm -hmm. you, the, the, her husband did not go to a boutique sort of mm -hmm. you know bath remodel place mm -hmm. you know the, 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 there, there's there's which i've been to some of those i've done a few bathroom remodels like the the models that you're going to find at home depot there's not a whole lot of range in terms of how they sit mm -hmm. you know if, if you're going to home depot for a toilet you're you're you know it's it's kind of like uh you know being mad that you didn't try the store brand cereal right before you left the store like it's store brand you know cereal. what you're you, getting you know what you're getting yeah it's also uh mm -hmm. the the law has a philosophy about whether or not you are allowed to take off your clothes and sit in a toilet in public. Right. And their philosophy is that you cannot. Right. And again, at these, mm. at these sort of boutique, you know, bathroom remodel places, they have small bowl toilets. They have heavy and low flow. They have short tall. They have short mm. ones. They have tall ones. They have metal ones. They have porcelain ones. There's like a huge range, you know, but I imagine he got like a standard white porcelain, that probably can flush a few golf balls mm -hmm. that sits relatively low. I mean, I can't imagine there was a huge range of, of options and comfortability. You could have tried, she, they could have tried out the one that, like the actual bathroom of the store, sure. seeing if that one was good and been like, can you just get me this one? Right. That way he got to try it out beforehand. Also, I've never, ha I don't, have you ever sat on a toilet that you had? Have you ever sat on a toilet that you had a strong opinion about? Yeah, like have, have I ever have I ever had a bad experience on a toilet? Yeah, I feel like I don't I don't typically have strong opinions about my toilet experiences. <laughs> Jesus Christ! I guess I have had some experiences in the past where like I, I don't I don't know if this was as a result of like maybe the bowl being shallow, maybe yeah. the water riding high, but I I have had instances where like my nuts touch the water. Okay, which is obviously not a great experience. You don't want your, you don't want testicles having water contact. Now that you bring it up, I'm kind of on the what did the cousin's wife side because if I bought a toilet again, that is a commitment that I'm going to be 
having this toilet every day in my life for many years, and I sat down the first time to use that toilet, and my nuts touched the water, I'd be like, "Fuck! But I should have tried is, out like, this toilet the, before the I left the store." The display toilets don't have water in them, though. There was no way to win this. You, you yeah. buying a toilet is truly a measure of faith. Yeah, no, it's true. You, I think you are really taking learned. a bit of a risk because it's like you know, so, some something like a toilet. There is going to be. Even if you do sit on it, there's mm -hmm. there's going to be a measure of unknowability mm -hmm. until it's actually like in there with the water flowing mm -hmm. and you're using it and you know it's it's actually being, you know, it's you're taking it out on the road. I'm curious. What did your cousin's wife suggest that he should have done? Just sat on it. Um, well, she she wanted him to sit on it, but like my follow up question to that is like, how accurate of a gauge can you get if you're wearing pants, pants and you on. sit on a toilet? If you're wearing pants and on yeah. top of it, and on top of it, a lot of your comfortability or a lot of the sit experience on a toilet has also to do with the toilet seat. Because there's a whole wide range of different styles of toilet seats that you yes. can put on any toilet. Yes, yeah, this, yeah. The same toilet experience, the, the, your experience with the same toilet could be bad or great depending on what the seat is on top of it. Right, right, right. You can, the, the seat is fungible. You can yeah. take it out. Put and the seat, seat is not the toilet's a commitment, but the seat is not. Right. Tell her that. Okay. That that wasn't even part of the discussion, so I'm glad you exactly. brought it up. Exactly. We need to think about this. This is the this is the it first is. person in the history of the podcast that I'm a hundred percent sure we helped. I <laughs> know uh, I like you, you. You've really cleared things up for me today. I'm I'm really appreciative. Is there anything else you want to say to the people at the computer before we go, David? Um, I'm I'm just a big fan of both of you, and I'm glad I got got to talk to you. Thank you very much. Do, do you think your Do you think your cousin? Do you think this problem could be alleviated maybe with the suggestion that like, well, maybe we could explore some different toilet seat options? Do you mm -hmm. think that would make your cousin happy? Mm, I'll have to pitch it. I'll see how okay. it goes. Pitch it. See how it goes. Call us back. All right, I will. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take care, David. What kind What kind of toilet are you riding on? <laughs> Not a fancy one. Okay. <laughs> Have you ever sat down on? There are some that have, uh, like, I don't know what the material is, but there are some that are like they're hard. Yeah. And then there are some that they have um, uh, the kind of soft uh, uh, material where you sit and it's like a Tempur Pedic where you it like. Like the seat? Yeah. It matches yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I remember those, but only at like when I was a kid and at like my grandma's house or like, you know, like an elderly person's house where you just kind of have that cushion. Mm hmm. You know, yeah, weirdly, I, 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 I haven't I haven't seen one of those in a long time. It's funny you mentioned that. Weirdly, now that I'm thinking about it, I've typically experienced the, uh, those toilets at the homes of elderly people. Right, but why is that reserved for a luxury need, later in need life? Some softness. Yeah, their butts are old and broken down. They need a bit of a, a soft. They need landing. the help. <laughs> when you're when you're young, you could you can bear have, the brunt. You, you you could have a you could have a seat of spikes, and you're fine. You know, but when you're 80, you, you need a bit of a, a, a pillowy, a pillowy throat. <laughs> oh, God. Let's talk to Morgan. Let's do it. Hello. Hi, Morgan. How are you? Oh, my gosh. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm here with Anthony Fantano. We're being geckos and talking to people on the phone. Uh, what's going on today? Nothing much. I was just kind of hanging out. Um, caught your stream. And then, I don't know, felt like I'd call in. Uh, Morgan, it says here that you stole a guy's social security card. I did. I did. Okay. Do you want to tell us why? <laughs> um. So, okay, I didn't like steal his identity, but I don't know. We were we were going pretty steady. We were in a relationship for a little bit. And then um, things were going great, you know? We were hanging out a lot. He introduced me to, like, all his friends, his family. She was, she was great. We were vibing. Um, and then, like, all of a sudden, he just, like, up and left. Like, no trace. Like, disappeared. He just disappeared? I could not get a hold of him. Yeah, like, like I could not get a hold of him for, like, 48 hours on end and I was like oh 
are you okay? Like, I just wanted him to text me and be like, yo, I'm alive. Okay. That's all I asked, right? So if you didn't know where then, he was, um, how did had... you obtain his social security card? Well, here's, okay, it gets juicy. It gets a little juicy. So I didn't hear from him for about like three, four weeks, like maybe a month. And I'm like, all right, well, this guy's just, I hope he's alive. But, Does he have social media you know, or anything? Whatever. Like there, there was no trace of this man anywhere? Um, so he's like kind of a, he was like a kind of a hippie, like doesn't use Instagram, doesn't have Facebook. He has Snapchat. Okay. That's okay. it. Okay. And did, did you, were you aware of any um, updates since he disappeared? No, no. <laughs> well, oh, well, he's alive. He's fine. Here. Okay. <laughs> so, so while we were after that, like I hadn't heard from him for a few weeks. I got like a text from his one friend because I had shit at his house. That doesn't really matter. Um, anyways, after like four weeks, he hit me at, like, I got drunk. <laughs> Bad. But, um, it was the day of my college graduation and I got like, down like three bottles of wine and I called him like 10 times. Crazy. I know it sounds crazy. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I hit him up and I was like, Hey, come over. And he's like, he replied. He was like, mm. Okay. I haven't heard from this man in weeks. And he came over. You know, for for the business. For the business. Okay. And then I was just like, you know, I'll let it go. Like I'm not gonna be mad that he ghosted me. Like maybe he's going through it. Um but then he left his wallet here hmm. and went home. And then he called me, he's like, Hey, I think I left my wallet there. And I, you know, my eyes lit up for the moment. I said, this is such a great opportunity. So he called me. He's like, is my wallet there? And I said, no, I don't see it anywhere. I was like, I was like, I checked under my bed. I checked in my sheets. I checked outside. Like I checked everywhere. I don't see that shit at all. <laughs> um, so, he, all of us, I don't know, he, like, came back, <laughs> and he, he didn't come back to my apartment. Sorry, that was the wrong thing to say. He, like, was, damn, I took pictures of his uh, credit card. I took pictures of his social security card, like, just in case he came back. <laughs> and then, basically, it just turned out it was a huge inconvenience for him. He had to cancel all his credit cards. He had to cancel, like, everything. Um, he lost his social security card, so, like, he couldn't get a passport. And he was, like, trying to travel and shit. So, I basically just fucked him <laughs> And I feel really guilty all of a sudden. Because today... Now, Morgan. Who... No, go ahead. Why do you feel guilty? Because, you know, he's a, he's a good guy. He was a good guy. And that wasn't okay. right of me. And today, two years, it's been about two years since that happened. Um, and he hit me up today and apologized for ghosting me. And he just was like, I'm really sorry. Like, I, I have a lot of guilt and I'm, I'm very remorseful about that. It was a weird time in my life. And I was like, wow. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> now, for, kind but, of dialing yeah. back on the story a little bit, you were talking about um, the crossroads that you were at when he asked you where the wallet was. You said this was a perfect opportunity. What, what, what was it a perfect opportunity to do in right. your mind? What, what, what was that an opportunity to do? You know, in my mind in that moment, I think I felt like it was it was a good opportunity for like revenge because right. he ghosted me, you know, he just up right. and left. And like that, that kind of, that kind of sucks. More than I, I, the, 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 the sounds usually... cliche, but I, I think, I think the lesson here is that hurt people hurt people. Mm. You, <laughs> you were hurt and legitimately not to, not to invalidate you being hurt. You know, um, this, this is more of like a personal self check here. You know, because if you ever feel these feelings bubbling up in you again, you need to 
ask yourself because this is, you know, you sound like a very nice person and this, and you're feeling guilty about it now. This doesn't sound like the kind of behavior that you typically engage in. You know, you, if, if these no, feelings not. ever bubble up again, you need to ask yourself, why am I feeling like I want to do this? Why do I feel like I want to hurt this person? Have they hurt me? Am I feeling upset about the way that they've treated me? And if you are, which it's, it, it's, it's valid for you to feel upset about being ghosted. Um, is there another avenue through which I can get closure mm. or some kind of, you know, um, a, a more positive feeling out of this experience and that I'm having th this experience that I'm having other than doing something that's potentially illegal. Cause you, you, yes. you, 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 you don't, you don't want to get caught lifting someone's <laughs> social, you know, I, and, kinda, and I have to know what like was like, so you took pictures. All right. Let me ask, by the way, do you still have these pictures? Right. So I have deleted them tonight because Good. I have done a lot of growing Good. And okay. that definitely isn't my behavior, my normal behavior. I was surrounded by two of my best friends, and it was kind of like, you know, was, we were there drinking. There was peer pressure involved? Was, mm -hmm. That's no excuse. Mm -hmm. No, right. there was actually, there was a little peer pressure, but not, Okay. you know. Okay. It was, it was a game time decision. I think Go deleting ahead, the pictures of your ex's credit card off your phone is a good step forward. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> but I mean, I, I, could, I could see how those situations formulate where... Again, you're you're legitimately upset, and you have friends who are upset for you too, mm -hmm. and their attitudes are like, "Well, fuck that guy." Right. Da, da 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 da. Which again, valid, valid. But but you don't want those feelings to push you in a place where you're doing anything like you're feeling right now that you end up regretting. Mm -hmm. There's lot. There's lots of ways to get yeah. that anger out other than doing something that you regret. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I like what you said where you were like, it is a, it is a lesson, a lesson in that idea that hurt people hurt people because yeah. he goes to you because there's something going on with him and then that upsets you. So you do this thing and then he gets upset that you did this thing. So he does another thing. It's just is an end. It's an endless cycle until you, you know, really kind of sit down and go, why am I doing this again? Did you buy anything with the credit card? So I was so tempted, but like, I'm like, I could not, I have done nothing with it. Like, honestly, that's good. That's good that you stopped yourself. I was, I was just so sad. Like I was just so upset, you know? And what were you contemplating buying with the know. credit card? You know, I was going to buy something really stupid. Like, I think my first thought was like a uh, you know, Amazon sells like 52 gallon drums of lube or like just something so outrageous. <laughs> I was I was I was having a text conversation with somebody who that that came up in convo. The the, the giant the 52 gallon of the, lube, the, the giant drums of lube they sell on Amazon. Yeah, apparently they exist. <laughs> yeah. I, like, I like how both of you had an experience with this 52 gallon drum I, I, of lube. I, sh I share I shared a meme that had a picture of. One of the and their um. reaction was, and I didn't know what it was. You know, obviously there was like a reference to lube in it, but mm -hmm. I didn't know what the hell that was. And this person said, "Isn't that one of those giant gallon, you know, giant drums of lube they sell on Amazon?" And I was like, "Is it?" So there's a second prong to this that <laughs> right. I see you've told the um, the call screener. Yeah, and this is it says um, that he does not know that you took his wallet, right? And you're wondering. Now that he has kind of confessed to you mm. whether or not you confess to him. What are your thoughts on that, Morgan? Um, I think at this point, honestly, he does not know. But yeah. honestly, I think if I told him, he might laugh about it. Like, he mm. might think it's funny. Hmm. I don't. Are, are, I don't really so, so, fear so, so he, to tell he's him. He's apologized to you for ghosting you. With that, has he actually re-entered your life? Are you guys close right, again? Yeah, are you talking sure. more again, or is he just kind of still out there, just doing his own thing? Yeah. Because because if he's just kind of off in no. his own world, maybe it's not something you want to bother him about. But if it's something that he's always around you and it's itching at you because it's mm -hmm. something that you did and you're mm -hmm. upset about it, maybe maybe it's something that you bring up. Mm -hmm. No, he's not in my life. He uh, He's pretty long gone. He's doing his own thing, and I've got 
there's also another part to it is like i don't know if i should tell my current boyfriend not that i actually he knows that i stole his shit he does but yeah should i tell him that he like apologized to me because he's like oh. i don't know my, he's kind of like wait I'm, wait I'm, wait I like so i mean if, if, like if, if, there, if there's listen if, if there's nothing currently going on between you two Maybe just don't bother your current boyfriend with it. I, I mean, I I, I think okay. we've reached a point where, at least in my own view, it's kind of a let sleeping dogs lie moment. You <laughs> kept the credit cards. You kept the wallet. You didn't get caught. This guy has moved on with his life. Oh, the wallet's gone. That's yeah, yeah okay. Gone. Well, 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 every, every, everything's gone. Everybody's moved on with their lives. Wait, wait. The wallet's You're... gone. What'd you do with the wallet? The wallet is gone. So I actually, I've, I, my parents live in like bumblefuck Egypt. So I literally burn it like <laughs> bumblefuck. Usually when I think of the term bumblefuck, I don't usually associate Egypt with it. I mean, you they, ever they heard live in bumblefuck BFE? Egypt. What is bumblefuck it? Bumblefuck Egypt. They just live in the middle of nowhere. You've never heard okay. that expression. No, no, I've, I've heard. I don't usually hear you know, it associated with Egypt. You could have told me that bumblefuck was like a place in Egypt and I would have been like, oh, really? <laughs> Fascinating. Usually when I think bumblefuck, it's usually a place out in the middle of the woods. Right. You know, just like isolated. Yeah, that's exactly like, where it is, but I don't know. Got it. Okay. I don't know why it's Egypt. Wait, yeah. so what do they have to do with this wallet? You like went out to where oh, they I live? I just burned it there. You burned it there. Okay. Okay. While it's yeah, gone and burned. I live in like a town. The guy, the guy is out of your life and he's seemingly having no impact. He just apologized. He doesn't know that you have it or he didn't know that you have a new boyfriend. He was just feeling guilty in his own mind about having ghosted you. He apologized. He's out living his own life. There's nothing going on between you two. And I mean, you know, potentially bring this up with your current boyfriend, I guess, <laughs> could potentially make for a weird situation. Hey, this guy who I used to see uh, who ghosted me said, you know, apologize, mm -hmm. whatever. You know, that apology is between you two. As long as there's nothing going on between you two. You could just close that chapter. The wallet thing, lesson learned. You feel guilty about it. You know it was dumb. You shouldn't have done it. And, you know, listen, in order to, you don't, you don't have to tell your, your partner every single bad decision you've ever made in order to have a healthy relationship. However, the fact that you told him that you took pictures of a guy's credit card and social security number and he took it pretty well means that you probably could. <laughs> yeah. So he was actually my friend at the moment. So he, I don't know, he knew about it. And I, I don't know, I'm an open book. So Okay, I mean, as, I just, as long as you don't I, feel like I there's any sort of risk involved with mm -hmm. sharing that information and maybe it's itching at you a little bit, I mean, go go ahead. Um, is there, I feel like there are there, are there any other layers to this or have we... Any other loose ends? Yeah, tied it all up. Um, um, I would like I to visit know. Bumblefuck Egypt, though. It sounds know. cool. Is that where the pyramids are? Um, yeah. It's, yeah, that's where they are. Uh, Morgan, anything else you want to say to uh, me or to Anthony Fantano or to the people at the computer before we go? Um, Anthony, I, I'm not going to lie. I don't really know who you are, but that's I fine. have to say... I have to say that, like, the way you give advice, it's just enchanting. You're enchanting. Oh, well, thank you. Appreciate <laughs> it. Like, it was great. You and Lyle, this is great. Um, Dream team. Yeah, Beautiful. I don't know. I hope, I hope everyone doesn't think I'm too crazy, but you know what? It's okay. If you do. Uh, who cares what people think, Morgan? Right, don't look at that's, the chat. That's, that's my vibe. Hey, take care, man. Right. You guys, too. Do you ever do anything like this on your stream, like like so people asking you for advice or anything sort of in the non-music world like this? There was um, maybe 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 like years and years and like pre Twitch, like yeah. when YouTube first started doing. Yeah, maybe I would sort of do Q and A and shoot the shit. Maybe somebody yeah. would have a personal question. Sure, yeah. There was a weird pocket that I got caught into once on Instagram where mm -hmm. I was doing, I was just like responding to comments. People left me on like Instagram stories mm -hmm. about, you know, music and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I think somebody asked like a personal question or something that was music related, but was something, you know, personal to them. Mm -hmm. And it sort of ended up being kind of like a 
life advice thing. Yeah. And then everybody was asking me like all sorts of different shit from like either relationship shit or like coming out to their parents stuff or yeah. like a whole host of different things. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, I, I was answering questions people were asking me like for weeks and weeks and weeks. Mm-hmm, and it was mm-hmm. like, you know, it was cool. People seemed to get a lot out of it, but like, you know, it wasn't something I could kind of devote myself to necessarily. It was mm-hmm. just like a bunch of Instagram stories. Mm-hmm. So I did that for a little bit. And, and again, um, with the podcast, I kind of sent back and forth to my friends. We're always kind of like going over each other's problems or decisions or whatever. Right. So, right. Yeah. But you said those, you were spending like yeah. and 30 each minute advice, voice, voice you know, memos. Are time. you, I was going to ask, are you a guy that like a lot of people, like people in your personal life, they come to you to talk about stuff? Sure, but also I I seek the counsel of other of people, other people as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like I'm I'm also quick to, you know, tell other people what I'm going through and and ask them what they think to get you know, perspective. You had an interesting angle on the the, the last caller because you know, uh, people come on here a lot and they'll talk about like bad things that they've done, and right. I think the internet and a lot of the chat or comments and I I just not even on my own show, but I just see this a lot. People will be like they'll be like you're a fucking asshole or you know fuck you you suck or whatever and like you know here's the thing is like i think when people are in a position where like they're coming they're they want like help of some kind it's like it's not that's just not helpful because you can't do any like if so if you do something that's bad and someone's like you're an asshole it's like that feels good for them to say but you the you can't do anything with that knowledge you can't just you know, I, I think I think that it, it's helpful to go in deeper and been like, be like, okay, well, why did you do that? What were you thinking? How, how can you, you know? Because I don't know. I think I'm big on that, like like rehabilitation and you know people's ability to grow. Yeah, and change yeah. You, you and have to whatnot. give people the room and the space to like change their behavior, right? You know, like um, it's it's kind of tough you know kind of thinking back to the first call there like um you don't want to continue to subject yourself to somebody relationship wise if they're not changing at all or whatever of course um but you know there's a difference between sticking by somebody romantically or platonically and keeping them in your life and constantly being hard on them and being angry with them because you know it's like you're not changing you're not doing this you're not doing that you're not Mm -hmm. doing what i want Mm -hmm. you're not bending to my will i'm gonna not forgive you no matter how hard you try or whatever um you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's a difficult, it's difficult to suss out the point that I'm trying to make, but like, you know, yeah. Well, it's, I just feel like it's different with like romantic relationships yeah, no, it than it be. is like with, um, you know, I don't know, people coming, you know, to their, to other people like for help or whatnot. To the point you were originally making, you, you should as much as you can leave space for rehabilitation. Right. You right. know, but rehabilitation doesn't necessarily mean, I continue to subject myself to you. you know, oh, of course. I, yeah. I, I oh, forgive, no, of I course forgive not. You. Of course not. I don't hold anything against you. Yeah. Um, you know, and I give you the space to, you know, sort of do your thing and come to, you know, whatever realizations you need to, to change your behavior. On yeah, your of own course. Terms. Of you know, course. You can't, I guess what I'm trying to say is you can't save other people. No, you can't. Well, I, especially, I mean, like, of course, of course, like if your friends being an asshole, right. You don't have to keep being friends with them. Right, exactly. But, you know, I feel like specifically in this show, when people come on and they talk about stuff and the chat is just, or everyone's like, you're an asshole, you're whatever. I'm like, well, that's, it's, that's first of all, boring. Like, we can't, like, somebody calls it's in. It's not discourse. You, you, it's, not, it's not discourse. That's what I hate about it. The, and as right. I also on, like, TikTok and whatnot, I just, I mean, you know, people on the internet, they're very, like, incendiary. Mm. And that incendiary nature even in situations where you feel like it's not um uh even in situations where you feel like it's deserved and maybe cosmically you do feel like it's deserved well, it well, doesn't you, lead well, to you know what it is people like to judge the, yeah of course you know especially situations that they see are kind of like outlandish where maybe they could never see themselves engaging in that behavior or tolerating a certain kind of behavior but yeah off oftentimes they are tolerating or engaging in other types of bad behavior right that are maybe right right more normalized to them because of right. either the friend group that they run with or how they were raised or mm-hmm. so on and so forth mm-hmm. you know like nobody is completely innocent of everything of course you know what i mean everybody has their flaws and problems and has their bad behaviors that they need to eventually come to a point where they realize that's not good i can't keep doing that that was a bad decision i'm not religious by light i like the idea that only god can judge like the only like if there were an, uh, like if there were an entity that could judge it would have right. to not be human probably yeah Are you a religious guy 
Uh, no, I wouldn't say I'm particularly religious. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm like open to religious? different sort of brands of spirituality, but brands I wouldn't say I'm necessarily closely following anything. What's your most... Um, what brand of spirituality is the most interesting to you? Um, maybe sort of more holistic, new agey, or kind of like, you know, Eastern spiritual philosophies that take into account, you know, sort of taking care of the world and, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Where do you think we go when we die? Um, I don't know if we go any place interesting, honestly. I don't know if I really have any kind of take on that. Okay. You know, we we may just end up in a sort of, you know, continuous mental loop with whatever synapses are continuing to fire through mm-hmm. our brains uh, after our bodies have given out. And maybe we just kind of do that until things go dark. Who the hell knows? If you found out that you were dying tomorrow, would you look back at your life and be like, yeah, I'm pretty proud of what I, how I got to live while I was here? I feel like I still have a lot of years left in me and that I want to do certain things with them that I didn't get a chance to up until this point. But I I could say that if I was going to die tomorrow and I was like, you know, aware I was dying, um, I could at the very least say that, um, I, uh, spent a lot of time doing what I love doing and that, uh, I don't necessarily have any sort of like major regrets regrets, in terms of like, Oh, I wish I'd, told this person that, or I wish I did this, or I wish I did that. You know, I I feel like in terms of my wheelings and dealings with various people in my life, um, I don't have any sort of like major loose ends that I'm wishing to tie up that I'm sort of like holding off on, on doing. So that's that's a, it's a wonderful place to be. Yeah, I think so. Hey, you want to take a call? Yeah. Hello, Tony. Tony. Hello. What's up, Tony? Hi. How's what's going? How are what's you? going on with you? Oh, uh, nothing much, man. I'm uh, just kind of in a crisis. So you called the Gex. <laughs> yes. Who better what's, to call uh, than the Geckos? This isn't a nine one one type crisis, is it? What kind? Yeah. What what kind of crisis are we dealing with? So, um, you know, as a public school teacher, okay. I um, have to preach to my kids that drugs are bad. And, you know, don't do drugs, uh, right. don't do alcohol. And then I go home and I just rock a hard bowl. Okay. Mm. So there's some cognitive dissonance yeah. in what you preach and what you do. Yeah. Because, you know, okay. a- as a teacher, I feel like I'm supposed to set the example. But weed is pretty mm. groovy, man. Mm. Okay. I mean, a, a couple different things. I mean, there is a reason that we tell kids not to do drugs and alcohol because they're, they're children. They literally shouldn't have, <laughs> yes. you know, yes. this, you know, may, it, I mean, I could, I understand why you wouldn't say this yeah. because, you know, um, uh, the school system would probably look at you weird if right. you did, but you know, you could always say to them, there's plenty of time in your adult life yeah. to think about or engage in these types of things. Mm-hmm. But your children, mm-hmm. You should have nothing to do with these substances right now. Developmentally, mm-hmm. you cannot handle it. Yeah. You are children. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, but so, I mean, I, I understand maybe the message that they tell you to, to tell them is maybe a little hard line, but I mean, you know, as studies uh, have shown, weed is far less, you know, destructive to one's mental health and general physical being than mm-hmm. alcohol is, and, mm-hmm. and alcohol is legal. See, now, if you uh, were like a cool eighth grader and you were telling everyone else not to smoke weed and then you went home and smoked weed, I feel like that would be different. Yeah. No, that would be different. So maybe I should reiterate that it, I am a high school teacher. Okay. So these kids are already vaping and sucking each other off in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, at what point should I just be like, hey, it's okay. I mean, even at that age, they they should like they shouldn't be vaping at fifteen. Mm-hmm. Like you know, the, like va- yeah. va- vaping at any age is not good. I mean, if you know, if I, I would rather some fifteen year old hit a blunt than be vaping constantly. Mm-hmm. But still, with that being said, even though they are teenagers, they're still not yet adults. They should still maybe wait the several year, the several more years it will take to get access to some weed or alcohol. When you were these kids age yeah what were, were you, doing? you vaping and 
doing drugs and whatnot? Uh, no, actually. When I was in high school, the uh, Dare to uh, Say No to Drugs program scared me so shitless mm, that okay. I thought I was going to die if I took mm. a hit of anything. Right. So, so to that end, do you feel as though there have been benefits to you at that era of your life to not doing drugs at the time? And could you then share your those benefits with the kids in a truthful way to you I mean, and your experience? To be honest, I felt like uh, me not doing drugs probably made it to where I missed out on a lot of parties. <laughs> okay. No, I, 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 could kind I of feel like I probably what... could have had a lot better time. You know? mm. I can kind of vibe with what Tony is saying because this also kind of seeps into another aspect of social education during those high school years because mm -hmm. I remember as Tony is referring to you know those dare program classes where they basically scared you into thinking the moment that you even touched a drug you would die yeah simultaneously they also had us go through classes that made you think that like the moment your penis touched a vagina you would catch this whole laundry yeah. list right. of STDs and right. then you would also die right you know um, I, 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 th I think there's a really I think societally, and I don't know how much it is in your power to do this as just sort of a teacher who's working in a, in a greater system here, but like mm -hmm. th there's got to be a middle ground between just advocating that people who are teenage make responsible decisions or maybe hold off a little bit longer to engage in certain types of behaviors for some reasonable reasons, mm -hmm. or if they do engage in them to do it responsibly, um, you know, condoms sex ed so on and so forth uh there's a fine line between that and lying to them right to the point where they're just living in a constant state of irrational fear right 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 and you and, it, and you don't want to do that and it sounds like you're not doing that there's nothing necessarily wrong with saying hey might not best might not be the best idea to drink heavily at this age right, right. because that's true yeah that's true you don't need to lie to them and tell and make up some boogeyman with alcohol in order to relay to them that cold hard fact right that that's not a good idea you don't need to scare them uh in order to you know sort of tell them what you know the, the, that's not a good idea right it sounds like you've been telling the truth like yes it's not as you brought up it's not good for you know 15 year olds to be you know vaping blackout and shit, drunk blackout and drunk so yeah. knowing that you are being truthful even though you as a 26 year old man are smoking weed, which is perfectly fine. Yeah, and that's the other thing. You're 26. You're allowed to smoke weed. How do you feel about this? Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. And uh, kind of what is on my mind, too, is as uh, a teacher, my, like, employee handbook, like, that say, basically says, like, it's okay as long as you don't do it at school. Uh, okay. But my wife, who is, like, works in healthcare. Hers is like, we're going to drug test you every week or every mm. month, and, you know, you can't do mm. no drugs. So I'm like, how come me mm. molding the future of children mm. can, you know, smoke? And But if she's just taking patients back, it's like, hey, don't do that. That probably has a lot to do with the fact that the, the weed that you smoke, do you get it legally? Uh, no, no, uh, no. <laughs> Okay, so 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 weed is criminalized in the state that you live in. It is, yes. Okay, I mean, working in the institution that you are, there may be certain legal limitations to what a body that is publicly funded, such as a school, can do to punish you or reprimand you for you know doing weed in your own spare time. Your wife, you said, works in the health system. Yes. And is, is what, working for a private hospital or institution like that? Uh, like a, uh, a private eye care place. Yeah, I mean, you know, be it the, given they're a private business, they can enact all sorts of ridiculous drug testing right, policies. Right, right. And that's really kind of dependent upon the person who runs the business, unfortunately. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sorry if that's not like the most satisfactory answer, but I mean, you know, at, yeah. the, at the end of the day, like, to, to put it clear cut, it's, it's because your wife's boss is an asshole. 
and <laughs> it's it's because your wife's boss is a fucking dick and and thinks that like oh well if they're smoking weed they're gonna be lazy and they're gonna come into work high and they're gonna fuck up at their jobs when that's not necessarily the case there are tons of people who live very functional yeah. and very deep and amazing lives who smoke pot on a somewhat regular it's basis it's always been fascinating to me that they test for uh pot but not alcohol when alcohol is just so much crazily more destructive oh sure. yeah absolutely yeah. but yeah your, your wife so your wife's uh, boss is just a dickhead a question sure sure uh if you have, I don't know if y'all have children, but if you do have children, how would you feel if you found out that your child's teacher uh, enjoyed the cannabis? My child's teacher? How would I feel if my child's, if I found out that my child's teacher smoked weed? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess like, you know, if they were just, I guess like, I, I wouldn't really care. They should, I mean, are they smoking weed while they're teaching? Yeah, that's the thing, and but the thing no, is, even in no, that like instance, off the clock. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who cares? Who gives? Who, who, who gives, gives a, a shit, shit, man? I, you're I being mean, pretty hard on yourself. I would this. actually, I would actually see my way to being somewhat okay with it on the clock, if and only if it were like medically recommended for like maybe some kind of debilitating Ooh, yeah. social yeah. disorder, yeah, anxiety, yeah. whatever. You know, because maybe there's like a certain, you know, medically recommended amount that you have in your system to sort of like, you know, uh, to take the edge off of whatever it is kind of like, you know, ailment or issue that you're dealing with. Uh, because, you know, weed is uh, prescribed to a ton of different people in a lot of medicinal contexts. And in those contexts, those people are expected to go out on the job or right. do, uh, you know, any uh, number of different things uh, while on, you know, uh, that substance so you know um but but just off the clock like who cares of course not I, I wouldn't care if i was in my local town and i uh went to some dive bar in the area and i saw the teacher that my kids see yeah you know every day of the week on the weekend just knocking back a few who cares i don't want my surgeon to smoke weed at all <laughs> The teacher could smoke weed, but drug test only surgeons. Yeah, let everybody else go. Yeah, what if what if the surgeons smoking weed? What what if they're what if what if when they're not smoking weed, they're always like this? Mm. If Let's the if the surgeon if I was hanging out with with like a surgeon and he was like, dude, you know how people are like, I if he was like, dude, I'm actually really so much better at surgery when I'm stoned. I? I might believe him. I don't know. Yeah. Ryan, is there... No, you're not Ryan. You're Tony. you're Tony. Tony, is there anything else you want to say to the people at the computer before we go? Uh, stay in school and do what makes you happy. Hey, take care, man. Thank you. All right, we got to eat our words real quick. This... this, this um, all right, that guy's wife's boss who forces her to the drug take test. the drug test. Yeah. What do you think's going on with him where he does the... What do you mean? What do you just like? What do you think is fucked up with him? Oh, I, I well, I, I think there's a lot of people who are small business owners who, I mean, you know, good for them for building something from the ground up. Yeah, you know, I mean, good for them. Be proud of yourself. You know, yeah, I think that's an accomplishment. You know, but but there's some people who, when they do that, I I, I think they feel as if they have the power, have the right to micromanage. You know everything that goes on in their business and all right. They things. feel some kind of um. Uh, so yeah. So he probably the, the boss probably feels some kind of like uh, desire to control. I want everything. my employees at a certain level of performance and, and cleanliness and trustability and this and that. And there, there's so many. It's probably compelled by fear. Sure, because there's so many. Um, there's so much baggage associated yeah. with like smoking pot. You know, it's like, oh, people who smoke pot are yeah. dirty. They're lazy. They steal. They this. They that. And Do you smoke pot? True. No, I don't. That's have you ever smoked a pot? Like, I, or... I've, I've never really indulged in, in in too much. I have a lot of substance issues in my family. Oh, okay. And and because I have ADHD, I have a, like a tendency to an addictive personality. Sure, yeah. So I just I just tend to sort of avoid it. Do you have any vices? Um, eating pussy. Let's move to the next call. Hello. Hi. Ella, what's going on? So, I have um, the fear of everything. and uh, Literally everything? It, yeah. Um, it's Toast. It's called pentophobia. Toast? 
What? Toast? toast? Yeah. Do you have a fear of toast? Uh, I mean, yeah, around some toast. I'll probably have a panic attack, honestly. Oh, okay. Mm. All right. Well, let's dive into yeah, this. Like, tell it. Tell us. Tell us everything we need to know about. It. I've never heard of this before. Is she? You said it's called pintophobia. Uh, yeah, pinta, pinto, whichever. Okay. Um, what's What's so, the deal here? Yeah. So I was first hospitalized for my first panic attack on um, when at the age of six, and that was from. Mm little fears when I was younger and then over time they built up and now it's literally everything. Um, I went and got a psych evaluation done and the doctors say that I am in a constant state of fear. So Mm. uh, yeah. um, In general, like when you said toast, it's like um, there are specific things, but um, mainly it's just I am in a constant state of fight or flight, constant state of fear. So it might not be the toast that sets me off. It might just be the smell of it or the environment in which I'm in or just the fact that my body is never not in a state of fear. So explain this more to me. Are you um, afraid of, you know, just sort of like things objects you know uh nouns like in the case of the toast uh in sort of like an irrational nonsensical way like you're not even sure what you're even afraid of or is your mind kind of like cooking up scenarios of like you know bad things that could potentially happen and uh, you know are, are are you afraid of abstracts or you know things that could occur are you afraid of a thing happening if you don't avoid a certain behavior or object or whatever are you afraid of an outcome or are you just sort of like afraid of various isolated things for uh, no reason that you could sort of deduce yeah it's a great question um i would say like d all of the above i have fears um specific objects and stuff like that will you know send me into a full-blown panic attack but uh, mainly it is the the my mind creates the worst case scenario of mm-hmm. everything and so um i have agoraphobia which is the fear of leaving the house so you know just yeah. walking out my front door will send me into like full-blown um panic attack uh you know and these aren't your normal uh you know panic attacks these are like um they get so bad that i go into non-epileptic seizures pass out stop breathing it, so uh i try to just you know uh, you know, sit in my room basically and do pretty much nothing because it's almost the fear of fear in itself. <laughs> mm, <laughs> if that yeah. makes sense. Because how they're so feeling... bad. I'm hmm. oh, sorry. You go. How, how are you feeling just being on the <laughs> phone right now? Talking I was wondering this. that too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm actually drenched in sweat. I'm shaking. I, um, yeah. I am having a panic attack currently, but when am I not? Uh, but, I do have medications that help make it manageable. So when I, you know, got on the line um, a little bit beforehand, I did take one of my medications that kind of helps me um, mm. be able to talk and stuff. So yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah. Like, um, so far, what have medical professionals and institutions recommend that you do? Just take your medication. Is there any other ask, sort yeah. of like? therapy um you know be it through talking or exposure therapy what, whatever it is have there been any other kinds of like recommendations as to what you should do to try to like help or alleviate your situation um you know that's like the crazy thing is like doctors will tell me crazy stuff like um i've had doctors say like you will probably die from your fear of dying So because I have such a high fear of it and my body's in constant stress mode and I'm releasing constant stress hormones, um, I actually have like no immune system, have a lot of health issues that come with it. And I, you know, um, but when I ask them, well, what do I do? They just, they all say the same thing, which is, you know, get therapy. I've been in therapy for a long time. It's, it's working. It's helping me, um, uh have at least motivation to like get up every day because you know Mm. for a while when you wake up every day and your body just 
goes straight to fight or flight mode. You kind of like lose the motivation to wake up every day, you know, and go through those feelings of passing out and, you know, seizures and fun stuff like that. But um, I will say the only thing I found that has helped um, is, and this sounds awful, but they prescribed me Xanax and Xanax Mm -hmm. does take the edge off very much. So it's been my saving Mm -hmm. grace. But because it's a controlled substance, they don't really give me a lot or enough to where I can actually have like a full day without panic attacks. How old are you, if you feel comfortable sharing that? Uh, 25. At, up until this point, are there any sort of like actions or activities that personally you found that calm you down or you or you feel safe engaging in that that don't sort of like you know create these heightened sensations i mean i'm not to throw like you know cliches out there but like i don't know coloring or solving a puzzle or i'm just spitballing you know are, are there it could be anything are there any activities that you engage in that sort of like don't heighten these feelings in you yeah um actually yeah uh, it's kind of ironic uh, music so okay. i actually have my piano right in front of me and I was uh you know just trying to stay calm I was like playing it and uh yeah writing songs writing ballads stuff like that it's Hmm. the only time I really feel calm I can attest to the power of music so yeah yeah Yeah. is is so I mean playing it what about listening to it Hmm. I've actually I've tried that um something about just listening to it does not calm me down i think i need like the i like the hand motion and like the i just really get into it you know and i close my eyes and i play the notes and i can feel it i can hear it it's all the senses you know i mean lots of neurological studies have said that the the act of physically playing music is is one of the most stimulating things that you can do for your for your brain Mm -hmm. um you know playing it uh, does it give you any sort of like I don't know, quote unquote, high that you can ride on for a certain amount of time afterwards? Or do you personally find that like the moment that you stop and you go engage in something else, like it's it's right back to where it usually is? Yeah, the moment that I stop, it, it's right back. And uh, I'm always when going into a really bad panic attack, I'm always just like, you know, where's where's my uh, uh, mobile keyboard? Somebody find my keyboard. <laughs> Right. Are there, and and that that was kind of the other suggestion or thought that I had, like, you know, do you have any sort of like openness to other instruments that maybe are a bit more portable that you can sort of like, you know, bring with you to calm you down or maybe kind of like get a bit of a musical session in to take the edge off a really intense moment? Would would you be into picking up a melodica or ukulele? I was thinking a kambala, right? That's what it's called. I mean, maybe that, maybe a harmonica. I have a kambala. Okay. Do, do, do you yeah. feel calm ever playing that, or does that not make much of a difference? It doesn't make much of You know, I tried it. I've gotten a ukulele, a kambala. I, I've tried those little, you know, portable instruments. And for me, really, I don't know why. It's uh, just piano. What about a melodica, though? Like like an air piano that you kind of blow into and you kind of have the keys in front what of you. What the hell is like, an air piano? I've never heard of that it's in my a little, life. It's a little... <laughs> they're, they're pretty popular in a lot of reggae music and dub. Um, you know, they're just like a little... It's it's just this little plastic set of piano keys, and there is a tube that goes from it, and you blow into it, and as you press the notes... Really? Yeah. I've never heard of... Melodica. It's a piano that you play with your mouth? Yeah, you just blow into it. Have you ever heard of this before? I I know what he's talking about. I've never played one, though. (laughs) Well, I mean, they're they're but, incredibly uh, portable, and maybe there's something mentally that you get out of sort of the arrangement of the keys, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah, I I will say like um, like woodwind and stuff like that. I I found mm-hmm. peace playing um, clarinet. Uh, okay, re- you know, just a normal recorder, and I think that's also has to do with breath work. You know, um, during mm-hmm. panic sure. attack, right? That's true. You hold your breath. Yeah. So that's actually I'm kind of curious. Thing. Does, does yeah. is there any part of you that like feels like you would get any kind of enjoyment or fulfillment out of like recording and sharing music, or are you strictly just enjoying being in the moment of it for its its own sake? 
Uh, you know, the dream actually is to be like a, a songwriter, if you will. I I wouldn't say I'm much of a singer. Not people always tell me I'm wrong, but I do. I wish I wasn't embarrassed of my voice, so I could share with the world my songs because I write a lot about my fears and a lot about what it's like to be isolated and you know have that fear of everything and I think it's pretty deep stuff and I would love to share it but I just kind of do have I do that have like the fear of um judgment and plus mm. I hate the sound of my own voice yeah but you're you're and, and this is the case for a lot of uh I don't know how familiar you are with what I do but I, I review music for a living and there are a lot of artists who I cover who are just releasing their own music independently, sometimes semi-professionally, sometimes not professionally at all, just casually. And uh, they, they just release music anonymously. I mean, you, mm. you could just drop music on the internet under an alias mm. or, you know, some kind of just like oh. avatar or whatever. Unless, unless you told people, nobody would ever know it's you. That's actually a really good idea. So far, like, this is solid advice. <laughs> um, you, you, don't, you don't need to go put your government name on your band camp record right, on, right, on the right. internet. You could just come up with anything. That's so true. Yeah, I mean, I might try that, but my my fear with that is like, if if you, I'm not able to promote it, then how does it get found? I mean, you could promote it, just don't promote it as yourself. I mean, start a Twitter account, start a YouTube account, just under the same alias, or just to put your name on it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I might give that a shot. I would. I feel like I've if we hear a heavy amount of air piano in it, we're gonna know it's you now. <laughs> If we, if if you come up with something and it has Kambala and air piano, we'll know. Has the word pentophobia? You guys are like, yeah, <laughs> caught. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the title uh, of the album, and it's just got nothing yeah. but melodica on it. Um, Ella, is there anything else you want to say to uh, the people with the computer? Kind of any other you know thoughts, feelings, sentiments you have about any of the stuff that we talked about before we go? You know, if there, you know, I'll say this, if there's anybody else out there that deals with panic disorder or anything like that, uh, it's hard. It's hard to wake up every day and it's hard to get through the days. But I just want to say if there's anybody out there that struggles like I do, you know, like don't give up and, uh, you know, just take it day by day. Thank you for calling, Ella. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. She made me think of, of a question that I have for you. About melodicas? About, is, is, okay, so you're a feeling empathetic person, caring person. Have I showcased that so far? You have showcased that so far. Okay, cool. And yet, <laughs> you're also committed to the truth. Has there ever been a situation where you meet an artist or something like that and you just love them as a person and they're so gracious to you and then you listen to their music and the music and you hate it yeah and you and just the you hate it so much right and you need to because of your respect for the truth publicly eviscerate them yeah and sometimes it's the opposite where uh someone by all accounts is a Mm -hmm. total fucking scumbag yeah but their art is great yeah it's amazing actually how does is is there any ever any dissonance with like in the for the former scenario where yeah, yeah, you no, know. There, there there's dissonance in both you know because sometimes somebody's you know trespasses are so egregious that it it, it you know it's it's one thing to acknowledge on a personal level that somebody's art is good right but it's another thing to use your multi-million sub platform to be like i'm going to promote this person mm-hmm. despite their horrible behavior interesting so you you feel worse about the inverse than the, yeah I, the, I feel worse about the inverse but I, I i i also feel pretty bad um about the scenario you originally you yeah. know, uh put as well however um you know i make it pretty clear either in my content or in direct content with uh, contact yeah. with some of these people that like yeah. How I feel about your music is not the same thing as how I feel about you at the end of the day. It's not personal. Have you had, um, and obviously you don't need to name names, but like, have you had situations like that where you've gotten a DM from a guy and you're like, man, thought we were cool, you know? Yeah. You know, but, but the thing is, you know, at at the end of the day, I I have to sort of explain we are cool. Yeah. I don't have anything personally against you. Right. I just don't care for the way you made this record. And look, you're continuing through what you're doing. Mm. I'm continuing through what I'm doing. I may enjoy your next album. Mm. And that has also been the case. There have been some artists that like, you know, um, through my platform, maybe I've like blown up. Right. And then their next record I don't like. 
-hmm. And then maybe they're just kind of like, what the fuck, Mm -hmm. you know? But then maybe two, three years down the road, they make another record and I love it, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, but, but I, I, I feel like, you know, um, that's just the nature of, of, of what I do. Right. You know, like I, I think at the end of the day, like a lot of people respect that, like it's independent. Yeah. You know, I'm independent from them. They're independent from me. Right. Right. I I don't get a whole lot of like artists publicly, you know, coming out to suck my dick over how great my reviews are. Mm -hmm. Um, I was going to, I was wondering that too. I was going to ask like, do people ever like kind of cozy up to you about that? I mean, you know, it's rare that it happens because I feel like I've made it pretty clear that, yeah. That's not going to get you anything. Right, of course. You know? And and the thing is, like, and, and I understand not doing it, even if you do personally okay. enjoy what I do on some level, because you don't want to make it seem like you're publicly endorsing right. some guy who may end up shitting on your record two years down the road. So, and, so then... And, and, and you give me legitimacy shitting on your record. I, I, I understand how that would be, like, a bad look right. on your fans. So what would it take for you to compromise your integrity? Um, No, I, I think my integrity is too valuable. Because I'm, I'm at a point where I have built up what I do in such a way to where it's exactly how I want it. Yeah. And it's also, I mean. That's hard, it's hard though, because both of those two scenarios that you uh, mentioned. Well, I, okay, okay. Are, I, I, really I, I, guess what, I guess what I'm trying to say here is like. I make good money doing what I do, not sure. to fucking flex. I'm not here to fucking flex on it. All I'm no, trying to say is like, yeah. I'm a long-term thinker. Yeah, 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 yeah. The amount of money that I could make doing what I do, being honest about it and yeah. being above board about it, long-term, I would make much more than any six-figure number. I see that's fucking fat. Yeah, I know exactly threw, what you're saying. Exactly what you're like, saying. You're hey, like, I'll pay you 500 yeah, grand to get my right, record a 10. Right, right, right. And it's like, I'd be flush. That'll work like, for a little bit. But that you're not going to become this. But exactly. Yeah. You know, it's like if if I to do that, I would have to trade in ten more years of success, just of flush down the toilet. Of course. You know, and look, I mean, there there may be a point where after five more of this, I'll just be like, fuck it, I don't want to do it anymore. Mm-hmm. You know. But I would still like for there to be the option. You mm-hmm. know, if I do decide five years from now, I want to do five more. You that's, know, that's smart. You know, because I feel like you, you, you know, it's it could be tempting to take some kind of like short term game, but you understand that your integrity is like here. Here's the here's, here's my plan. I'll sell sure. the fuck out when I'm when I'm done. When what I'm, is selling it, out? Look, what is selling out look like to you? I have no idea. I have no idea. I'll completely compromise my integrity when I'm on my way out the door. <laughs> As I'm stepping out the fucking door. <laughs> Then I'll take my $2 million severance pack. So you're saying towards the end of your career, there's going to be a lot more tens. Yeah, yeah. Toward the end of my career, listen, if 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 you guys ever see me, let, you know, if I ever come on camera, I'm like, hey, guys, this Drake record's a fucking 10. I'm out of here. I'll see you later. I'll see you later. That'll be my last video. <laughs> and I'll be vacationing in the Bahamas right after. Let's see what we got over here. Lana. Oh, can you hear me? Hello? Lana. I was about we to hear you. your thing. Hi, Lana. Zoom how are you? Hi, sorry. Bell, I had muted right? myself. Um, Lana, what's what's going on with you? Hi, Lyle. Hi, hi, Anthony. Hi. How's it going? Good. Um, so, Lana, listen. Uh, I do you want to tell us what it is that you called in to talk about? Yeah, I'd like to. Um, I just knew you were going to pick me somehow. So. Okay. Um, my mom is an animal lover. She's all, she always has been, you know, dogs, hamsters, pets. I mean, all kinds of pets she's had. And um, she has a parrot, one of those uh, white ones, uh, cock- cocktail, I think they are called. I'm not, I'm not sure about the name, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and she she pets it on, she, she does something without knowing it that arouses the pet. Mm. Basically, when she pets the um, bird on the back, and this is a fact that I found out later after we got the bird, is that any birds like that, the big parrots, when you pet them on the back, it arouses them and they, it makes their sexual instincts, you know, I, I just, it just arouses them. And so my mom's way of petting it is how she pets a dog or a cat. She pets it on the back constantly. And... I can. I didn't know it in the beginning, and I somehow found out this through TikTok. And now, 
oh, every time I just see it, and I don't know how to bring it up with my mom that she's arousing, excuse me, that she's arousing it, and she has been arousing it this whole time. So, need advice how to approach that. I mean, after she does this to the bird, does it engage in any weird behavior? Does it hump things? Oh my god! It... Okay, at first, I thought it was just being cute. It was just getting excited and it was just being lovey-dovey. But now it's just it like like it looks too excited. Like when you know it might be aroused, you're like, oh yeah, that's that's what an aroused bird looks like. Have you ever seen as the bird? ever come in her hand it's a girl so i don't think it comes but another awful thing could can girl bird do girl birds squirt um i haven't seen it do that but it does like put its butt out like it feathers out its okay. tail and it like pokes its butt out like as up as it can okay like take it kind of way you know all right, and, and as far as you like, could oh, tell, he's taking it butt around. Excuse me. Yeah. Go ahead. And, and and as far as you could tell, your mom is completely clueless about this. Like she doesn't oh know my that, God. that it's yeah. having this yeah. effect on no the bird. Idea. Is is your is your mom up there in age or? Mm, she's uh, about forty five. Okay, so she's she's not super old or anything like that. Do you? Is your mom? I mean, in in the past, when you've had to approach your mom about maybe touchy or weird subjects, uh, has has that historically gone well, bad? Is is your mom someone who typically well, you feel like you can open up to and be yeah. honest with? That's the thing that I know. We've never had like e talk, you know, like sexual topics were just never brought up. So that's what's awkward about it, really. Are you more, are you more concerned at this point for her or for the bird? Right. Um, the bird, definitely the bird, because it's getting just sexually frustrated. It's not, you know, getting fucked or anything. It's just getting so, frustrated. So, so you, th- you, think, you think your mom is bringing the bird some kind of frustration? Mm. Oh, definitely. I, I know it's frustration. That's what the, you know, that's what the internet and everything says. Okay. That you should not do that to your bird, constantly frustrating it. Yeah. So, so, so in a way, it's sort of like it, it's 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 like an inadvertent kind of maybe animal abuse in a way or something. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I, 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 I don't think these animals. That, that far, I gotta say that the way like, like a mistreatment. The know. way that you're have the fear that you have of this conversation. I feel like it's a, the fear of the conversation makes it sound like you think that you have to tell your mom that she has to fuck the bird. <laughs> Because no, if that were true, that she, then that would be a tough conversation to have. But she totally doesn't. You could just let her know what's going on. There's no like, you know. There's, it's, I, I feel well, like it's got a, it's a pretty it? simple conversation. I mean, for in in, in your because obviously you've done some digging on this in your research. Have you seen that there's any harm that may come to the bird long term by way of just you know petting its back or? Here's the awful thing. The bird recently has started to lay eggs. Okay. Where where did she get those eggs from? We have no clue. It's been like three eggs by now. They're hollow inside. Okay. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm I'm no zoologist, but like, isn't that something habitually all female birds engage in to some degree just egg laying do they do they have to i um um, do they have to have sex before they lay eggs usually it's do they just fertilizes the egg that's what i thought apparently they don't it's the bird the egg is hollow there's nothing inside i guess it just has i guess female birds would just have the shell naturally i guess because it's it's not been fertilized or anything like that i don't i don't think the bird is laying eggs because it's horny well, in my head, I'm thinking it's getting frustrated so often that it's like the body is, doesn't understand what it's doing, and it just that's why she lays the eggs, and it's not natural. Wait, for her so to you're do saying it. you that's think that the bird is so horny that she got <laughs> pregnant without having sex? Like it's like a Virgin Mary type of situation. It's ima- your bird was immaculate. Are you conceived. afraid of one of these eggs cracking open, and there is a bird fetus that looks like you inside 
I am terrified of seeing what's inside. Or it of looks Indiana. half bird, half your father. Right. Oh gosh, I haven't even thought about that. I mean, okay, so so what what do, what do you feel like is the most ideal outcome here for everybody? I mean, I, I, guess, I guess like let's. Do you feel like your mom is doing any kind of like damage to the bird? Do you feel like just, your mom is is doing anything inherently wrong here, or do you feel like a lot of the agita around this is mostly just around you feeling uncomfortable around 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 this information? It it, it feels almost like kind of Eve biting the apple kind of moment. Like mm. if only you never stumbled upon this piece of information, you could have completely shut it off from your mind and then thought like, oh well, that's just my mom petting a bird. Mm. But now you know it has like some kind of like weird link to sexual arousal within the bird, so you can't get that out of your mind now. Well, sure. I mean, if I, I just think, I think it's awful that the bird is constantly frustrated, but it seems like you don't mm. think so. It seems like it's all in my head. That's what I'm just well, I, I, I guess I'm just sort of wondering, like, you know, you could see that the bird is, I, I, I guess here's the thing. If you feel genuinely in your research and from what you're observing, because I don't see the bird, I can't tell you. If you, if you feel like in what you're observing and in what you've looked up about, you know, birds in the, in this fashion, uh, if if you feel like what your mom is engaging in is doing a disservice to the bird or making it frustrated or hurting it in some way, it doesn't have to necessarily be physical pain like I'm punching you. You know, if you, if you feel like your mom is genuinely hurting the bird in some way by petting it in that fashion, I, I think you should just be honest about it. You know, just be like, hey, listen, the way you're touching the bird is in my, you know, here, I looked this up. You can look at it here. It's making the bird sexually frustrated, which may not be good for the bird for reasons X, Y, Z. If you want to touch the bird or you want to have some kind of physical contact with the bird, maybe just pet it on the face. Maybe, I don't know, just like touch its talons a little bit. Maybe feed it a peanut. I don't know what the hell you do. But, you know, there are other ways to engage with the bird that don't involve running your hand along its back and sexually frustrating it. Just maybe just do some other things. You know, it, it, it could be bad for the bird or maybe not the best uh, for, you know, for its just general mood and well-being. I, I feel like, you know, all you can really do in those situations is just be open and honest about what you found and what you understand. You know, it's, it's upon the other person to take that information and, and actually change their behavior based on it. Those are really right. adult, uh, explanation of yeah this i mean bird if, situation. if you've done that you can at least clear from your mind that like well i told her and if she chooses not to change her behavior past this point that's on her you know at, at this point it just seems like you have this information inside you and it's itching mm -hmm. and you should probably just get it out because you know it and you feel like your mom should know it and uh you know again at, at least from there you can wash from your mind well i've done my part i've been clear with her about what's going on and if she ignores that information then that's on her you know what do you think about all of this lana i think that's a very well put together i just i guess i couldn't find the words and you just kind of found them and put them together in an order that i would like to present them to her and I guess my biggest concern now would be when to bring it up. Just wait until she does it again to be like, hey, mom, actually, I get, oh, just the thought of it makes me so uncomfortable. When's, when's, when's the next time to bring it up to her? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I guess, yes. Okay, I'll tell you this much. I don't know when the right time is, but the wrong time is while she's petting the bird. Oh. Probably, yeah. And, and also just to sort of do a little thought experiment here and, and maybe kind of illustrate what is the basis for your fear here. What do you feel like is the worst case scenario? Say you told your mom everything that I just told you in the way that I put it as clearly as you possibly could. What, what, what do you feel like is the worst thing that could happen? To be honest, I'm not even scared about the outcome as much as I'm scared about how uncomfortable it's going to be. Okay. I mean, well, you know, this could just be a moment of practice for you to to kind of break that fear a little bit because, you know, there's going to be lots of moments in your life where you are going to have to tell people stuff that they may not want to hear, that you may not necessarily be comfortable sharing or being vulnerable or honest about in a certain situation. But we all have to we all have to face those situations down because, you know, believe me, you're going to find yourself in positions where you're going to have a hesitation to do that. And the stakes are going to be way higher than your mom petting a horny bird. Oh yeah. You oh, know, yeah. so, you know, take, take, take this as sort of like, you know, mm -hmm. a test run. 
<laughs> because honestly, there's there's not much wrong that could happen in the mom petting a horny bird scenario. There are much worse things that can happen in yes. the scenario where you're afraid yes. to come forward with information, where maybe lives are at stake, or maybe someone's livelihood or well-being is at stake. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you know, push through this, so maybe you can push through something, you know, um, a bit more high stakes down the road. Ella, is there anything else you want to say to the people at the computer before we go? Just thank you, and I hope you have a lovely night tonight. Thank you. You know, um, it would suck to be that bird. Like, imagine if anyone just lightly touching you got you insatiably horny like that. Yeah, it, it would depend on your vibe. Some people like edging. Yeah. Well, she, that's what her mom is doing. She's edging I'm not, I'm the not bird. self-reporting. <laughs> well, you know, you know t- how often do you jack off? Um... I used to jack off way more often. I, I would okay. I would say a healthy amount. You know, like you know, a, da- What's a healthy like amount? daily. Daily, daily is yeah. a healthy amount. I think I think daily. If you're doing like maybe uh, okay, fuck yeah, four to five times a day. That's not okay. Good. All right, you're, sick. You're just eating up too much time. I thought point. daily. Guy, sometimes I talk to guys and they'll be like three times a week, and I'll be like Wait, three times a week. That's too little. That's too little. Yeah. Okay. All right. I feel validated. Yeah. I think daily is fine, especially just before bed. Just knock out, go to sleep. You know, it's, it's it's a weird thing. It's uncomfortable for Ella to talk to not wait, she, uh, Lana, mm, Lana to talk to her mom about bird sex. Mm. But yet, it's weird with talking to your parents about sex. Is like that's how your relationship with your parents. It's how you exist. Yeah, is 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 how you exist. Is sex. Mm-hmm. But I guess your her relationship with her mom has nothing to do at all with bird sex. Until this bird sex thing came along. Right. Let's take another call. Sounds good. Hello. Whoa. Hello. What's up? This is happening? Cool. Uh, It's happening. It's happening. It's always happening. This is happening. The LCD sound system album. All right. Everything everything is happening. It is the moment. It is now. This is the moment we're living in. Hi, I'm Eric. Hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. Right. Do I just like do the thing? No, I tell you. Yeah, do the, the do the thing. What's your I'm problem, Eric? What's the problem? All right. Um, I seem to have a problem with uh, joining cults. Um, so to set this up a little bit, I'm a pretty religious person. Um, I've recently tried to explore my faith a little bit deeper because um, I feel like a, a lot of people they're a part of a church because their family was a part of a church, you know. Sure. Um, and, and that was what I was like. And now I'm starting to go in with it and like, what do I believe? Like, what am I trying to like understand here with this community? Uh, so I've been trying to reach out to um, these different organizations that seem to be uh, what I'm looking for. Organizations where they, um, they say, oh, here's this community of like-minded individuals who are all trying to explore and understand their faith uh, in, a, in a way that uh, is really good. Okay. Um, now, the first organization like this I came across was Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, if okay. you know anything about them. Um, they, were, they set up a table at my old college, and they had like a little pamphlet that said, uh, what questions about God do you have? I'm like, oh, I have questions about God. So I took their pamphlet, and I'm like, wow, this is really interesting. Maybe I should look into joining these Jehovah's Witnesses, you know? Hmm. Um, and then I talked to my family. and like, hey, do you guys know about the Jehovah's Witnesses? And they're like, oh, yeah, they're a cult. And I'm like, what? No, because I didn't, like, know anything about them. Uh, so I did my own research. I looked them up, and I'm like, oh, yeah, these are some quirky guys, Um so I got a little disappointed that uh, the organization or club or whatever that I wanted to join uh, was really controlling and they actually didn't uh, believe in the things that I believed or wanted to actually explore the things that I wanted to explore. Uh, and then I met another organization at a different college. This is like a few years later. And they were also tabling at my college. Hmm. Um, I went up to them and they were also handing out flyers and basically, Oh, we have this event going on. And I'm like, Oh, that's perfect. And it, they were exploring the book of Exodus. And I'm like, hell yeah, that sounds awesome. 
So I take their little pamphlet and I read through it. And I'm like, whoa, this sounds exactly what I want. Like a bunch of like-minded individuals coming together and trying to explore and understand the faith in a, in a good way. Uh, so I go to their meeting um, and oh boy, uh, I, uh, I didn't want to um, label them as a cult at that point. I just wanted to say, like, hey, maybe they're just charismatic. Uh, and, and people are just, you know, weird and college students. Uh, so I'm like, okay, I, I went to their meeting, uh, saying worship and listened to their sermon. And I'm like, okay, I got some weird vibes out of these guys, but you know what? I think I'm going to give them a shot, but I always like to talk to people, um, before I go into anything serious. So I talked to my friends and like, Hey, do you guys know anything about this organization? Literally the first thing they say is, uh, oh yeah, that's a cult. And I'm like, What? No. So I go ahead and I look online and uh, start some red flags come up. Like a student organization um, isn't actually connected to anything nationwide. So I'm like, well, that's interesting. Usually it's connected to a church and they have a big network or whatever. And I dig and I dig and I dig. Turns out uh, it's part of this um, Chinese minister who came over with the express idea of creating a group of people who only listen to his message and he has his own translation of the bible and uh all these things are like oh this is super sketchy and made me really sad then there was another table at the same college literally like a week later um which basically had a thing that said uh ask me questions about the bible and i'm like oh hell yeah so i go up and i have this like nice conversation for like 30 40 50 minutes or something like that i think i got a lot out of that and uh, the guy said, you should really join our uh, Bible study. I'm like, all right, sure. And they gave me a pamphlet thing. I'm like, all right, cool. I'll look into you guys. Uh, and I talked to my friends again. And they're like, yeah, those guys are also a cult. And I'm like, <sighs> and now at this point, um, I'm getting really discouraged because I feel like I'm being honest. Like, I want to pursue these things that I find really interesting and I want to dive deeper into to have a better relationship with with God, you know, and also the people around me. But every time I try and do that, it's a cult. Okay, okay, all right. And now I have a bunch of questions. I, I think we can get to a nice answer and a nice medium for you, but I have a bunch of questions, and I need you to answer them as straightforwardly as possible. One... I will do my best. Now, w w would, you, would you consider yourself, you know, like a spiritual and religious person? I would consider myself religious, yes. Okay. Now, you say you have a bit of a religious background. What kind of church or denomination did you grow up in with, with your family? Uh, if you know anything about the uh, Christian, it, I think it's technically considered non-denominational Protestant. Okay. Um, okay. That, that was kind of the background. Uh, if you know anything um, about like the different big Christian organizations, I think it was Praise uh, uh, Assembly uh, was one of them, and then... Uh, I, know, I, 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 know, I know a little bit, but I guess what I want to ask you is what personally do you feel like is wrong with just continuing to explore religion through a church and an organization that your family is already connected to or that you're familiar with? Is there something yeah. that you feel like the Protestant church or that church in general is lacking that that you are seeking in your you know religious exploration here? Uh, well, here's the thing. I've moved away from my family. Uh, unfortunately, okay. both of my parents uh, died, and my brothers aren't religious themselves. Like, they've expressly okay. moved away from it. So I'm basically on my own. I'm in a okay, new well, city. Well, I'm well, in a listen, new state. There's, there's, lots of, there's lots of more, much more mainstream denominations of Christianity, be they Protestant, be they Methodist, be they Catholic— that you that you're free to sort of explore because they're they're in more of a safe zone Baptist mm -hmm. be, because they're in more of a safe zone because they're they're you know obviously any organization and any sort of like religious group as you sort of found with that one club can have you know their issues and their problems and it'll be upon you to sort of like sniff that out when you're there but you know it seems like you're through these tables which my other recommendation is avoid any table <laughs> avoid any if, there's, a if table. there are tables <laughs> with two or three people tests. trying to get you to join something yeah 
avoid that. Avoid any tape. Maybe it's maybe it's people with a religious group. Maybe it's a military organization. Avoid it. Hey man, you if you could, if you, you just, want just pull out. If you want, you can co- you can come be Jewish. That as well. You know what's is I've always uh, respected is the, we're we're never I, trying I, to get I other people to join. I, I can't. I still got my foreskin. I can't have that. You still got your foreskin? Well, I, listen, man. They they're still cutting off foreskins. If you want to show your devotion Ooh. to the cause, whatever the hell that cause is, and they and, got mine. I don't even maybe. know what I gave it up for. I mean, L- L- Lyle brings up a good point. I mean, maybe there's a cause in exploring other religious or other religions entirely. But mm-hmm. I mean, a- again, if if we're speaking strictly sort of like a Christian denomination here, uh, again, avoid tables. Avoid any people pamphleting you generally. Uh, I, I think that's a bit of a red flag. Honestly, it, it feels like you don't necessarily have the problem here that you pose to begin with, because in each of these instances, you didn't join these cults. You know, they, they talk to you and they cause they stirred True. a bit of interest in you. Yeah. But then you did some research, which people joining cults often skip that step. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's that's kind of the pivotal <laughs> skipped step. <laughs> When someone when someone joins a cult, yeah. they don't often Google it right. to go find out more about the cult. They mm-hmm. just join, and you know, uh, okay. I, I guess here's my last question: like, what what do you feel like is your main drive for being? Obviously, you didn't join any of these cults, but maybe you're a little worried because, in a right. way, because you're, you're seeing this pattern, you feel maybe a little susceptible. What what do you feel like is that void that you're trying to fill by, you know, I, I guess humoring these interactions? Are you looking for some kind of community? Are you missing a community aspect from your life? Or do you genuinely feel like there are aspects to your religion and your spirituality that you don't understand and you are looking for some kind of guidance on through a reputable religious institution? Or is it both? No, uh, I have to say it's not so much the community aspect anymore because um, mm. your recommendation basically was to get plugged into a more legitimate church organization, not something at a right. table. There, there are lots of churches done. across the country, yeah. and that we would love to have. You. Yeah, we would yeah. love to have you. And and, and, and like run, that, I could, the run, thing that I'm, I'm like, I'm most like, what is what are you yeah. looking for? Like, That's what I'm the most because you said you you said you're not looking for a community. Because I think I'm trying well, to get down to the bottom of what I, I, I have you already have a community. Yeah, it sounds like he's to, looking for spiritual guidance. I'm trying to dive deeper into this thing. Can I ask right. you this then? I'm trying to. All right. So if you have a community and you're looking for spiritual guidance, when you just close your eyes and you sit in a dark room and you think to your, you look inside yourself for that spiritual guidance, do you find anything? You mean like through prayer? Sure. Sure. Uh, Through whatever whatever that even means to you. Yeah, I I do feel that connection, but that's only happened recently. Hmm. Okay. I mean, again, if you are looking for some kind of spiritual guidance, I I, I would try to just seek out a more reputable uh, religious institution to to do it through, and that way, even if what you know, even if even if you engage in it and you find that you're not finding what you're seeking, you at least know that you're not dabbling in a cult. What do you what do you like? Do you have strongly held beliefs already that you are um, trying to find a, 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 a church that aligns with them? Or do you have questions that you're looking to get answered or something or? A little along both lines, I'd say that I had loosely held beliefs that I thought were true but didn't understand why. So in this part of my life, I'm trying to uh, ask questions and understand on a deeper, more fundamental level what it is I believe. Uh, I'm going to – I just want to say – go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um. I'm trying to pursue uh, others because, like, um, I, I, I'm a generally an intelligent person. Like, uh, I do pretty well in classes. I understand uh, mm-hmm. stuff. I can help other people to understand things. Yeah, and, and so you've avoided it, it these cults. For me to take the position. Huh? 
Yeah, they would have gotten you. And and you've invited these cults. If you were stupid, yeah. you would have joined the cults. Can I just I just want to yeah, say this, yeah, Eric? Exactly. I, 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 and this is kind of my thoughts on this summed up is that um, you're on this crazy spiritual journey trying to figure out what you believe and whatnot. And I think you have this desire to want to label it because label because when a thing is weird and intangible it's, it's a little bit harder to wrap your fucking head around and when you can find a nice label for it it makes it easier but i wanted you to challenge right. yourself to not need that label for right now as you're going on this journey because the label's not a inherently necessary thing to you and your spirituality okay it can be its own colorful non you know finite labeled thing uh, so again i understand your desire to want to find a home for yourself that you can refer to and grab and share eloquently but um you listen you know focus on that focus on that sweet journey there you know instead of driving yourself crazy about this label yeah i mean uh, explore your options yeah. You know, I mean, to have faith in the fact that you did a great job avoiding joining these cults. Mm -hmm. And if you have any sort of like, you know, honestly, like I feel like the anxiety that you have around this could be totally wiped clean if you just avoid the tables. Because, you know, people who are on a college yeah. campus handing out pamphlets, trying to say anything that they want to say to you to get you to come to their club or come to their meeting or come to their whatever, like they're, they're there to manipulate. They're there to get you to, you know, sort of join up in their function uh, r rarely are they there to challenge you. They're going to tell you what you want to hear so that you come out to the club. That, that's literally the whole point of being uh, there. Although I've thought about this. What, like, look, if you did decide you wanted to give up and fully submit yourself to this cult, <laughs> you, that would probably be nice. Can you, imagine just give, can you imagine giving up and just being like, I'm going to let this cult dictate exactly what I'm going to do and think? I mean, thinking about things is so hard. Yeah, I mean, so, li listen, I would, yeah. if, if, if you're interested in any of these cults, I would ask them, what are their benefits? Is yeah. there a compound? Are there three square meals a day? Do they offer health care? Do they do offer get a health care? And listen, if you find a good deal. If you find a good cult deal, let us know. Please let us know. Uh, Eric, anything else you want to say to the people at the computer before we go? Uh, yeah, uh, do your own research. Uh, understand what you're getting yourself <laughs> into and uh, have a good night. It's probably past your bedtime. Thank you, Eric. Have a good night. Thanks for taking my call. No problem. I think it'd be great. I would kind of want to have like a gecko cult. I don't I don't really have anything to offer anyone, though. Right. I just have. You're going to need a compound first. Right. To make a compound with some bunk beds. So it sounds like a logistical nightmare. I mean, it could be. I mean, you have to be passionate about your cult. You yeah. Be really passionate about controlling people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so passionate that you would overlook the logistics to be like, you know what? There, this is a pain in the ass, but I get to tell people what to do. Yeah. Isn't it? You know what's crazy to me is that evil and anger are such emotional things. And like the logistics of planning out a compound is such a non emotional thing. Mm. And throughout nav like placing the bathrooms and making measurements for the walls and stuff. You know, right. No part of you is like, why the fuck am I doing this again? Oh yeah. Cause I, I want to control folks. Well, that's, that's because your, your, your drive to become a cult leader. Isn't, isn't that, isn't that strong? Someone yeah. who really cares about it, you know, they're, they're literally there making the Kool-Aid recipe right at the very end for everybody to drink. Um, I think, uh, dying in a mass suicide with other cult members I wouldn't do it, but I get it. Yeah. You know, you're not alone. You found your community. I mean, because you die, if you, if you don't die in a mass suicide or anything, you die, you're alone. You die, you die alone. That's true. Alone. I mean, your family is, your family would be there, hopefully. Yeah, but they're not ideally. going with you. But they're not coming with you. Right. And it'd be kind of nice to have, like, you know, people to. Yeah, like 50 to 200 other people. Yeah. It kind of sounds yeah. nice. Yeah. I get it. I wouldn't do it. And I wouldn't recommend anyone do it. Right. But I'm not going to say that I don't understand the appeal of taking part in a mass suicide. Right. It's definitely kind of, it's a bit of a vibe. It's a bit of a vibe. Yeah. Also, like, the parties that they throw before they kill themselves have to be right. awesome. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Loads of cocaine. How do you want to die? Like, who cares? You're, you're, you're about to die. Do you have um, a way? Quietly. 
Quietly. <laughs> Quietly. Yeah. Isn't it a tragic? I feel like hospitals. There's a lot of noise. There's like hustle and bustle and machines yeah, beeping. I don't die and in a hospital. Where do you want to die? Like a hos- oh, a hospice. <laughs> we have a quieter. I, I, I'm not sure if I have a, a preference on location. Just uh, just just not a scary, violent death. Mm-hmm. You know, just like a just a quiet death. You know, people. Um, I've probably talked about this a thousand times, but uh, people uh, people don't like the concept of the like the. I think it'd be so sick to die in some apocalyptic event that okay. destroys the world. Cause how beautiful is it? The idea to die at the end of the, like you die with everyone on everything else. Well, yeah, that's not too much. Unlike the cult scenario, right? You're not alone. Exactly. In, in sort of being off in this giant meteor hitting the planet. I feel like I'm going to need some emails after this from some cults. Probably. And I'm going to read them. And you're going to read them. And then you're going to research. And then I'm going to do my research, and who knows what the research will yield. If they have good benefits, you may join up. Before I came on here, it was my goal to be the best guest that you ever had. The best. Number one. I can't... Um, fucking one. By, by what metric? Because I, I, can, I, I can't... I, I, really have no, I really have no idea. At least in my own mind. In your own mind? Yeah. I can't make declarations like that because I, I would never say that one guest is better or worse right. than another one. I understand one. that. I understand that. You're doing great. I'm happy. To, I'm so glad that you came on. I can tell that like you listened to the podcast and like you don't and understand. And that I've been wanting like, to do the, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, you, like you put your. I'm, I'm very happy that you like you put yourself into it. Yeah, you know? like when, like we talked months ago about doing this. Yeah, and ever since that day. Yeah. I've been thinking about doing this. <laughs> when you were listening, like, have you ever had, like, where you've been listening to the podcast and you're yeah. like, I know what I would say to this person? Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Absolutely. Hell yeah. I'm glad that um, uh, uh, you you were able to come out and do this. And yeah, fucking me too. Strut your geck stuff. Whatever <laughs> the fuck that means. <laughs> Hello. Hi there. Hi, Oscar. Yes. What's up? How's it going, man? Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm doing very good, thank you. <laughs> I've called you so many times about different things, and I can't believe this is what you decided to talk about. But I'm actually very glad. Oh well, tell us, tell us what's going on with you. Um, so basically, <laughs> I thought I would talk about this this thing I've had for a while. Um, I've opened up to others about it, and um, I've never met someone that can relate, but I used to be extremely obsessed with my own poo when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Obsessed um, with it, to what extent? My mum my had to clean like shit off the walls several times. Mm. It happened at like school as well. And I also had a thing where I just really liked shitting in places where you're not meant to shit. Mm-hmm. And basically, like, what like, kinds of places that you were not meant to shit did you shit? I did it in like um, a bush in my neighborhood. One time I did okay. it in a public pool. Okay. Um, there were times where I did it in the playground at school or in like the sink, just in some not very good places. And, and what, what age range are we talking about in which yeah. you were doing this behavior? Honestly, like too young to remember, probably since I was like a toddler and posse trained and stuff up till like 11 or 10. Oh, okay. okay. So, so you, you did this all the way up until age 11? Pretty much. Okay. And I've never met someone else who was like obsessed with shit, but then I learned that I just had autism. Oh. What do you mean by, because like, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you right now, you know, the age range that you're describing right now, I, I don't know how you're feeling about this, man, but I, this seems very, seems pretty standard to me. I, I feel like once you're getting really? to the Were double digits, I, I, once you get into the double digits, I, I feel like once you're getting to the double digits, you're kind of pushing it. But yeah. the thing is, like, from what you're describing so far, you've you've stopped this behavior. Yeah. Is, is 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 this over and done with, or? Yeah, no, it's it's very much over and done with. The thought of me doing that now is like if it makes you feel any better. But I've just la- never met someone I, who feels the same. I so every time I take a like an impressive poop, I will take a picture of it. Uh-huh. 
I mean, really? Oh. See, because my last relationship, my girlfriend would do that a lot, and it kind of started to bother me. I feel really bad, but like because I said it, it was kind of started to bother you. you. I thought you would find her to be a kindred yeah. spirit, right? No, because first I was like, yeah, I'm I'm very down with that, but then I realized I actually wasn't that down with it. Okay, so so let me ask you. You're telling you us know, this because when I was little it... as well, like I was really obsessed with like the feeling of, of like shit, not like the act of it, but like I would like break it into little pieces as well, and it was like genuinely so hard for me not to like break it into little pieces every single time I shot. Uh -huh. Or shit, or shot. I mean, look here. Here's the thing. Um, when you have a neurodivergency whether you're on the autism spectrum or you have ADHD, uh, there's all sorts of anomalies where especially very young kids uh, will become absolutely obsessed with doing something that for whatever reason that they do, they mentally just find it stimulating. They find it intriguing. And scientifically right. speaking, there's not like any kind of answers per se as to what draws someone to one specific thing hmm. when i was a kid and I, and I have adhd i used to grunt all the time i used to have i used to have this deep physical need to make this weird grunting sound yeah. and i'd be idly making it all the time right. i used to drive my dad fucking crazy he would go insane um you know he'd be like <laughs> screaming like going nuts because and I, I could understand how it's annoying you know that i'm just a little kid making this a very audibly annoying sound all fucking day. I feel like day screaming a bit much. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not, yeah. I'm not faulting the guy. He's he fucking had roid rage, uh, and I don't talk to him anymore. He's a piece of shit. Right. Um, but you know, the thing is, like, yeah, um, I can see why. Uh, you know, when 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 you are on, you know, some kind of neurodivergent spectrum like that, there's all sorts of behaviors that are exhibited in children where they just get, in a way, just kind of addicted to an act. You know, be it a weird physical quirk or um, an object or a substance or a whatever, playing with it, touching with it, interacting with it, doing whatever with it. In your case, it just so happened to be a very taboo thing to want to play with and touch with and do anything. Did with. you? So, like, were you how right. were you like scooping poops out of the toilet and rubbing them on the walls and shit like that? <laughs> yeah, I had a very long okay. time. Like yeah, and is whole... it now now listen it says that you hear that you feel a lot of shame over this is that true do you feel active shame over i do this as I mean, a 21 like year old about this, they find yeah. it really weird no because i, 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 I like can't get over it. i don't so find it that weird still. if you were like a kid no i mean look in the in the grander scheme of things this could be a neurodivergent anomaly especially right. if you're aware of the fact that you're autistic um, because again, kids mm. obsessively engage in all type. If you look at it in the grander scheme of things, what you're experiencing is not that weird. Kids who are on the spectrum engage in all sorts of weird, obsessive behaviors that eventually at one point as their brains develop, I mean, some do, some don't, depending on, you know, uh, their severity of their neurodivergence. But a lot of them, when they reach a certain age, as you did, they become less obsessed with the behavior. And it sounds I like think that's a lot just of it sort of just comes from. I, I was just going to say a lot of it isn't even so much as like oh I feel so weird about it. Still, so this specific instance though of me like shitting in a public pool haunts mm -hmm. me to this day. Just the thought of that and the, the fact that I just like didn't even think about it in the moment. I, I'm like that was like where it got too far for me. Yeah, I, I imagine there's probably a lot of social shame around that and that you got some pretty gnarly reactions yeah. to that. But but by that same token... Oh, no, because the um, thing is, it was closed by then. They, like, closed the pool, so I have no idea oh, okay. what happened after or who had to Oh, really? Up. Okay. But, but, but yeah, again, no, you said... Kind of like so were, were you swimming in the pool at the time? Yeah, and they were, like, calling people to, like, get out because they were closing, and I was like, I really need a shit, but I don't know where the toilet is. So I, I shit in the pool. Oh, okay, so so in that instance, you engaged in the behavior not because you have this weird obsession. You just had an emergency, which happens to all kids. Like you're you're far from the first kid to shit in a public pool. Yeah, it just wasn't really a second thought there at the time. I was just like, you know, hey, this is just a, a new place on the list to add to the, the shit location.
but, but yeah, yeah but, no, you're totally right. Like, it was yeah, from what you say, it just sounds like you had an emergency. In my mind. Which, which, is, which is why they put chlorine yeah. in the pool in the first place. For kids are shit because in there. they know that kids are going to piss and shit in the pool. <laughs> no. I've yeah. also been on the other end of it, though. Like, I've been at the pool when someone else is shit in the pool one time. They have to well, there, the pool. Does that yeah. give you better? Like, when somebody else shits the pool, are you like, hey, man, I was there. I, get I was pissed. I was like, dude, why are you shit? You were pissed. I have done that before. At least, yeah, look, no. I, this, I feel like this whole situation, it's a, you know, window into you to be able to have more empathy for people when, you know, they they take they shit shits. The they shit on you. They shit in the pool. I never even thought about that. Yeah. Um, I, I've never had anyone shit on me, luckily, have you? Yeah, I, 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 you haven't you haven't shit on anybody, have you? No, no, not yet. Okay, I don't think I mean, necessarily well, probably needs to extend sympathy to someone shit, sh- shitting on them. Like, yeah. as a baby. What if they had I'm a really sure good reason to shit on, on their parents? I don't know what that reason would be, but what if one arose? I mean, like, I'm not, I'm not saying that at any point in my life I'm never going to let someone shit on me. I'm, I'm open to a lot of things. Okay, okay, rock and roll. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Don't don't knock it till you try it. Well, all right. It sounds like you have the next thing that you're going to call in about already queued up. I would love to call back about this once I. Well, we okay. don't know yet. Do we? Oh, here's. Can I just say this? Once don't. You've done some research. Don't just don't go out and get shat on just for the sole purpose of making so that you can come back and talk about it. Do it if you really want to do it. No, yeah. I would never. Okay. Yeah. No, um, really. Oscar, is there anything else you want to say to me or to Anthony Fantano or to God before we go? Yeah, actually, because Anthony, I, I used to be on the Anthony Fantano hate trade, I'm not going to lie to you. And it's I, one day I came to the realization that the only thing more annoying than Anthony Fantano is Anthony Fantano haters. Haters. And I that's started right. watching you, and I, I was like, "Wow, I, I like this guy." And then I figured out that you rated Charlie XCX's self-titled album the best of 2019, and you instantly that's became true. one of my favorite people on the internet. And that uh, was one of the greatest I, pop I records of the 2010s. And the Vroom Vroom EP. The Vroom Vroom yeah. EP was and, amazing. Uh, I, I was I was on that EP before a lot of people were. Hi, Kate. You very much were. And I think even when I'm disagreeing with you, I just love that you listen to, like, literally everything. You always give your, like, actual opinion and actual, like, critical thought. I respect that more than anything. So thank you, sir. Really cool. Thank you, sir. <laughs> of course. <laughs> hey, thank you very much, Oscar. You have a good rest of the night. Thank you, Gek. Bye. And, and and that's why you can't trade in your integrity. I was because thinking that. that. Guy, I was like, yeah, because, you know. Because that guy, you know. Yeah. He he value he sees value in what I do and he knows that I'm coming from a serious place. How often do you? I feel, I feel like I'm in the position where I'm always I'm always talking to people who watch me. How often are you like, like you know, interacting with people who watch you on the computer? I mean, I, I wouldn't say I'm interacting with them all the time as much as I'm just kind of keeping track of what they're saying because sure, because yeah. a lot of the time they're recommending stuff for me to listen to. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. they're like, hey, check this out. You know, I'd, I'd much rather check out a recommendation from a fan than like some random PR email. Right. It's just sure, like, hey, sure. check out this brand new band that I'm being paid to tell you about. Right. You know? sure, sure, because sure, like, sure. at least if I know if a fan is throwing it my way, even if I don't end up liking it, I know that they recommended it from a passionate place. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like they're doing it for free because they're just really excited about it. You mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. Um, and that and that more often than not is is what leads to some interesting stuff. Hello. Hello. What's going on? Um, well, I guess uh, I'm just calling in because... So I've been chasing a dream trying to make music for like 10 years. And right. it's kind of getting embarrassing at this point, I guess. How old are you? Um, 25. That's it? Um, yeah. Well... Do you know how old James Murphy like, was when he started LCD Sound System? Do you know how old Chuck Berry was when he had his first hit? They were both no. 10 years older than you. Oh, really? Yeah. LCD Sound <laughs> System? Literally the first LCD Sound pretty... System single is about being old and washed up and irrelevant. Losing my edge. But that's all I write about now. 
because that's all that it, I just feel. Well, it worked for James it. Murphy, and now he's the front man of one of the most popular bands in the world. So maybe it'll work for you. True. True. Okay, look, look. What, what's, you, what's, this, what's, 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 what's this dream look like in your head? Like, if the dream came true, what would the dream look like? I guess just, like, being able to support myself and the people that I love to some degree with just being able to, like, play and release music. Okay. Um, what, uh, do, do you actually get any enjoyment out of the process of just just recording and making music itself like do, could you see yourself happy oh. just making music without necessarily you know doing it as, as a profession or something oh yeah 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 i mean i would i'd probably be doing it even if i went to go do something else more like full time and put more in time and energy into other stuff i i've always loved making stuff it's the <clears throat> and, and like playing stuff it's a lot of fun but. Okay, because here's the thing. I have friends of mine personally who, who, you know, be they friends or be they just people who I know, you know, through through the industry, who make music for a living. I mean, obviously, there's no surprise that I know people who make music for a living doing what I do. But the thing is, oftentimes, the act of making music, once it's become their living, is the thing that they find themselves doing the least. Because once it's, be, once it's become your living, you're worried about, selling merch and landing shows and doing performances and label stuff and promotion stuff and PR stuff and uh, band chemistry and dynamics and, you know, uh, networking within the industry and press and so on and so forth. And, and then after all of that, there only ends up being this tiny sliver of time with which you have to like write your next record in order to keep the lights on in your house um, d does that sound like a sexy mm. setup to you? Damn. No, no, that doesn't sound great. Well, I guess that's, and that's guess why I'm calling it to like, should I start redirecting my life to do something a little bit more, you know, cause I'm also like embarrassed by like, it feels like a really selfish pursuit, like a very like masturbatory thing, like as cool as it is and as fun as it is, like the whole process of being like look at me and like this thing I'm doing is kind of it's kind of embarrassing to some degree um I don't Why? I don't just really... like would you, would you be would, do you think it would be embarrassing if one of your friends was like you know uh, maybe they had a nine to five but on their off time they we're playing footsies here um in their off time they painted paintings and were like hey I made this great painting look at my painting would you be like ew that's cringe why are you spending all your time painting no, no, I would I definitely wouldn't do that. Yeah, you're just making art for the fun of making art. There's no shame in doing that. There's no shame in showing it to other people. True. Very true. No, I, I don't think you should give up on your dream of making and enjoying making music. And, and I don't think you necessarily need to, like, you know, um, rule out the potential to be successful at it to some degree but you know no know, know this like there's so much about making music as a profession that has yes yes it does have quite a bit to do with talent and it has quite a bit to do with whatever your ideas for a song are but it also has a lot to fucking do with like luck and marketability and whether or not what you're saying resonates with an audience of people, which like all have to do with factors that are so far outside of your control that in some cases, it doesn't matter how talented people are. Just some people don't get the right opportunity or they don't have the right message or for whatever reason, they don't find the audience of people who would actually connect with what they're doing. And that's just, you know, a roll of the dice in some instances, you know, or, or in other instances, sometimes it's about who, you know, because there's some people who en enter the industry with connections, you know, uh, which, you know, nobody can help, you know, neither of us can help or fix or change. Um, you know, all you can really do is like, just plug away at what you enjoy doing. And if you find the time to do it in your spare time, maybe upload it to TikTok, maybe put it on YouTube, Maybe throw it up there on the internet in some random place and just see if people take to it. Maybe put it up on Bandcamp. You know, maybe you'll sell a few hundred, you know, digital sales of a record that you're really proud of or something like that. Who the hell knows? You know, um, 
uh, you know, the, the only people who I know who aren't kind of living that lifestyle that I explained to you earlier are people who have reached such high levels of success in the mainstream that it's it's the chances of doing so are lower than winning the fucking lottery. You know what I mean? But I'll, I'll, I'll say this to end things off. 25 is not too fucking old to be making music. You know, honestly, like you're, you're at an age where you, you, you honestly are starting. If, if you're actually, ex, you know, putting yourself through ex, various experiences in life, you actually probably have more to say than, uh, you know, someone much younger than you with less, you know, experience and less perspective on various things. That's a um, good point. You, pro you yeah. probably could put more into your art now at 25 than you could at 18. Could I, could I ask you one more thing real quick? I kind of forgot about it because I just kind of got nervous when I got on. Sure. But just in regard to like the whole idea of feeling selfish, I guess I'm like, that actually comes from more of a feeling of like, do you think it's okay to put a ton of time, a ton of energy and a ton of money into something when you could be putting more time and energy into like, a job and like opportunities with a career and take care of like a significant other. And you know what I mean? Like that's like, I, 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 I it's, it's all, it's like, all about I, finding, it's all about finding balance at the end of the day. Like obviously, you know, we, we could have all sorts of discussions about the economic and capitalist and societal systems that we it, live under that make it very difficult to have any leisure time or time to ourselves and enjoy life and so on and so forth. But we won't, we'll table that for now. But like, obviously because of the life that we're living under, uh, you're expected to put a certain amount of time into just the basic necessities of paying your bills, taking care of yourself. Every, everybody's responsible for that. You're going to have to do that at some point. You can't run away from that forever. You know, so there are going to be a certain amount of responsibilities as you become an adult, more of an adult. You're just going to have to take on. Um, once you have reached a point in your life where all of that is taken care of, if you have free time left over to do things you enjoy, Use that time that you have left over to suspend it however the fuck you want. There's nothing inherently wrong with whatever is your free time beyond taking care of yourself, paying your bills, keeping a roof over your head. Uh, whatever time you have left over, there's nothing wrong with spending that time, uh, as long as you have no other responsibilities, just indulging in things that you enjoy doing. There's nothing wrong with that, especially if they're things that aren't destructive to your personal well-being and health. There's nothing wrong with, you know, if, if you told me that you like to spend all of your free time smoking crack, you know, I would probably have a different recommendation for you here, but because you like to spend your free time creating art, that's a lot healthier and a lot better for you personally than any number of things that you could be filling your idle time with. Also, you're right going to die. So make the fucking songs <laughs> while you can, my friend. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about uh, everything that Mr. Anthony Fantano has just told you? Um, I mean, this is such a surreal moment, but I feel pretty good. I was having a conversation with a friend who's like a music mentor of mine before I got on this call because I was talking to him about this, and it's kind of yeah. echoing the same stuff. Um, so it's just kind of, it's cool to hear it from somebody you look up to, I guess, from two people you look up to. Yeah, you should, uh, like, you know, give yourself some perspective. In the grander scheme of things, you're still pretty young. If you're too old to be doing what you're doing, you should give up. Like, what hope do I have? I'm pushing 40, and I'm reviewing records that were produced by 18-year-olds. You know? Uh, yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> Word. Um, Thank you. Mike, real quick, I'm just curious. What kind of, what kind of music do you want to make? Is it dubstep? Um, I mean, <laughs> No, I, I mean I've been I've been doing like just singer songwriter stuff for a long time. Okay, um, cool. It used to be acoustic guitar, and now it's like way more involved with like Ableton and like producing these long, complicated things. But it's fun. It's a lot of fun. You know, I'll, also, um, you know, my uh, uh, you know, just just for like personal perspective, uh, my my stepdad's a musician. Yeah, and. He loves nothing more than just dicking around in the studio all day and just making random shit and logic and random shit in Ableton. Yeah. And he just uploads it to SoundCloud and he makes beats and plays guitar. And sometimes I listen to the stuff he makes. It's actually insane, despite mm. the fact, you know, it sounds like way out there, despite the fact that he doesn't know about any of the stuff going on in music today. Mm. And and he's a good guy. I wouldn't say he's a selfish guy or a bad guy or whatever. Right. He just likes to, it's just a hobby. It's just a fun thing that he likes to do. And some of it comes out really good. I mean, you know, uh, and sometimes he puts it out there. Sometimes he gets a few plays. Sometimes it doesn't. I mean, it's just something that he enjoys doing. There's nothing wrong with that. 
Yeah, I you know I I under I understand this idea of I understand where the idea comes from of uh, feeling like you're only serving yourself. But then also there's you know we haven't even touched on the whole aspect of like you know if you create music and other people like it like you know you do a lot for them in mm-hmm. that sense. Sure, that's true too. And and I get sort of like the idea of like um you know wanting or having other responsibilities like maybe you want a partner maybe you want to have kids maybe you want to have whatever sure, as, as yeah. he was like referring to but you know as i said like uh, my stepdad is a guy who did all those things right you know and he still made time for the and music. he always made time for either playing or learning or practicing or you know especially now in his older age producing so you know he's a guy who took on different stages and chapters in his life and his passion for music never never left him just because you're doing new things and you're taking on new responsibilities doesn't mean that you have to sort of like throw everything that you ever cared about in the garbage and you're like okay well gotta get a regular job and gotta have a wife and kids better throw my love for music in the garbage it doesn't have to be that way that's that's silly right 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 it's a bit of an all or nothing kind of um kind of a thought pattern right you're 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 giving yourself too black and white of uh a situation to exist in it's either i have to mm. live this normal boring totally vanilla like you know white collar life or i need to be like the successful music star who's doing mm. what they're doing full time there are some musicians who i know who you know uh, uh make a living off of what they do but then they also have a nine to five too you know that, that they're able yeah, to at least maybe take there. some time off of to either tour or record or whatever mm-hmm. you know there's lots of different ways to uh operate through this thing we call life and yeah. um you know th- there's no one right way to to do it how you feeling mike true good i'm feeling good i'm feeling a lot better thank you so much is there anything else you want to say to the people at the computer before we go uh i'd just like to say uh i love you melon thank you for giving no dream such a high rating and i love you lyle uh thank you guys so much this was great thank you thank hey you much appreciated man all right, let's find out about that corpse. Care, Mike. I like, I like, I could, you know, I gotta say, I could really, and this stuff always makes me happy. I could really tell how much Mike appreciated you saying what you said to him. And it was nice. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I, listen, it's. I get fucking emails all the time. I'm sure you that do. have that have that same mm-hmm. kind of, you know, mm-hmm. like a concern. Mm-hmm. And I'm not advocating for just sort of like blind negligence of everything that you should be sort of handling and taking care of to obsess over this one thing you know but there's there's a way to balance it it's funny because i think and i guess i'm not super keyed into like we we talked way back in the beginning of like this you know polarization or hostility that you think is 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 a thing of as a result of being a critic but you're you're not a dream crusher you're the opposite. You're you're an inspire. You you are liking to inspire the artists. Oh, I, sh- I shit on records, but the thing is, like, I I always have it in my mind that like the next one could be better. Of course, yeah. Always optimistic. Like, I don't want any, I don't want anyone's career to be over because of a review. That nobody making a bad review means that. But I mean, but no, nobody making a bad. Nobody nobody making ten bad albums means that the next one's fucking doomed. Right. Exactly. I mean, maybe ten. Yeah. Maybe 10 I mean, at, 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 at the point where it's 10, maybe that person's musical style just isn't for you. <laughs> you know, at the point sure. where it's 10 albums. Maybe it's um, not your vibe. And also there's, there's the whole aspect of it not being for you, you right. know. Um, I find that fascinating. Which is fair. I think I think it's valid to review things based on that perspective as long as you come at it from the perspective like this is just my opinion. Hello. Hello. How are you, Joe? I'm okay. How are you? Anthony? I'm glad to hear you're doing good. Um, Joe, what, how can we help you today? What's going on? How's life? What, what, what is it you'd like to talk about this evening? Okay. So I was seeing someone and um, we actually first started hanging out during a hurricane, but our first date essentially was going to a funeral home together. Um, it just kind of happened that I got asked if I wanted to go in the hearse. And I was like, well, I've never been in a hearse before. So, like, why not? So I went with him and his friend, actually. 
And then we got there, parked the hearse, and they were like, want to go inside? And I mean, is it is this weird to be as a, even... Well, well, wait a second. What, what's, what, 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 what's, what's the reason for all this access? Is this guy, does, does this guy work at the mortuary or at the funeral home? His friend currently does, but he used to as like okay. body yeah, okay. removal. Okay. Got it. Okay. So, so that's the reason he had access to the hearse in the first place? Yes. He was okay. driving the hearse and he had to return it. Okay. And <laughs> so... So it, was this really a date? It just kind of sounds like this guy was a little weird and morbid okay. and, and, want, and wanted to show you some dead stuff. And just, just, why, just, why would just, that make, see, just to see why, how you would react. Why would that make it not a date? <laughs> was it, was there dinner involved? <laughs> you, it sounds, can I say, it sounds like you're into fucked up, like, more, like, uh, what's the word? M- macabre? It sounds like you're into macabre yeah. stuff, too. Yeah, I mean, kind of. I, like, don't outwardly express in a way that I'm into those things, but, like, my art is very dark. So I feel like people don't assume that about me, but he definitely had, like, seen my artwork and things like that. Okay. So I think he, like, at the time, it was, like, also kind of around Halloween, and, like, I was doing a lot of gore, special effects, makeup, stuff like Mm. that. Is anyone in the situation um, so, a goth? Um, I would say my best friend is, but I'm not. Like, I wear okay. Lululemon. Like, I look like a basic bitch. I have blonde hair, blue eyes, pale as fuck okay. skin. But, you, but like your mind basic. is just filled with disturbing images that you have to get out on on in, in an artistic fashion. Yeah. Well, to pre- to preface this, I've had a bunch of fucked things happen in my life, but this summer. When I was in New York City, I witnessed, like, two different murders, like, different Mm. parts of different murders. Um, So that kind of, that was, like, the first time I saw a dead body was in the summer. So that was, like, a lot. So in regards to this, Um, like, you know, corpse trip that this person took you on, like, are you process are you are you seeking guidance or understanding on how to process it are you feeling some type of way about the whole situation or yeah i think that it kind of sent me into a spiral i didn't expect because with the stuff that happened this summer i had a really hard time processing it at first but my mom is a firefighter and she was like move on like I've seen dead bodies and like, it's not that big of a deal. And I started to Mm. feel guilty. Like there are people in war stricken countries that see this shit as kids. Like it's not that big of a deal. It's like, yeah, but they do. But no, 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 don't, 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 don't say that. Don't say that because for those kids, they are traumatized too. Right. And while your mom, I'm sure has seen some horrible things and has had to push through uh, that due to her job, you know, witnessing surprise, witnessing a murder, is kind of a different thing than being somebody who's a first responder, knowing that the likelihood is high that you you may go into a situation that is dangerous. I'm still, I still want to know. We haven't gotten to this. How, like, how was the date with the, the guy? Like, what? the date. Okay, yeah. so Let's finish. How's that. the guy? Okay. So first, we went in, and then um, he like took me into this one room, and I thought it was just going to be like to see the tools and stuff. Like, it was pretty like aesthetically pleasing so i'm like looking around and whatever and then i noticed that there's like two like what stretchers i guess with blue sheets over them and i like process like okay those are people and then he walks over and like uncovers them and i'm like oh and i didn't i just didn't say anything i just my mouth was just open and i just didn't say anything he was like oh is this too much (laughs) and i was like it's okay. cool. <laughs> what like, can I? So I after, <laughs> le, le, are you? Can I ask this? Are you? Did it go in such a way that you would like to see him again? I have, and I mean, it went from that to then he took. Then there was a freezer, and then there were a lot more bodies in the freezer, and then we went and sat in like where they have the services, and his friend played the piano and we like sat there and listened to it and it was kind of romantic but 
Yeah, and then I kept. Oh, wait, so, okay, so I can't, I and work. like, just forgive me if this, I just, I can't tell if you had a good time on this date or not. Right. Because you're what, saying it's romantic and that you saw the guy again, but also that you were traumatized. Were aspects I of think it that were triggering. That's yeah. the issue is that I don't know either. Like, so, okay, okay, so, so you've seen this guy again since then, right? Yes. Okay, now, when you saw him again, did you have a normal date or did you go back to the dead <laughs> bodies and, and have another hangout with them? <laughs> like, you know, is, is no. this guy capable of like, can this guy take you to a movie or, you know, bring you out to dinner or maybe like, you know, hit the arcade with you or whenever you hang out with him, is he just bringing you to the dead body place? Dude, what if he's a vampire? I think I'm imagining him as like, <laughs> I, Edward, think they, uh... they, I think they prefer fresh 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 meat fresh yeah meat. that's true that's true but, but 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 yeah have you have you been going on regular dates since this um well we went to a museum but that's, also hey, that's a, a regular that's a regular date okay wait, 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 wait what, what kind of museum was it <laughs> i can't really explain without giving away too much of my location and technically this stuff before is like possibly illegal so i'm not going to say it. but it was definitely like a weird museum not an art museum but kind of but were i don't know dead things that were now were there dead things in this museum that there were, were actually there okay. were heads. It, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's not it's not like it's not like a museum where they have taxidermied animals there's like weird dead stuff in it no there were taxidermy animals too it's like it's like a collection okay. Okay. Wait, I don't. Okay, I don't. I kind of want to guess it because I, I have an idea of what it is, but also I, I don't want okay. it's. Did you, you go? Did you go to the? Weird, is it weird? Did you go to? Did you go to the Mutter Museum? The what? Mutter Museum. No. Is that what it's fucking called? Never mind. This is a museum in Philly. I think it's called the Mutter Museum that has like. Okay. Weird okay. 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 We, he we, took we, you to another we, like. We, we, we don't, weird we don't want you to give up your location. Was this a weird museum? Was it weird? Yeah, I mean, it's been weird every time, and then it, I mean, like... How many I, How many yeah, times actually, have you seen this guy? I, we never went on a normal date. Oh, I've seen him a lot of times, but it's never been <laughs> normal. Okay, okay, like, so, okay. He, every right. single here's, time you okay, see here's, him, it's here's, a, here's, here's my question. Okay. Do you enjoy this guy's company, or is he just consistently weirding you out? Or are you in <laughs> some way attracted to that? Um... I think maybe I think that I struggle with the balance of that. Like I am on the outside. I look very simple and basic where I do appreciate when people can understand that maybe I might be interested in things like that. Like, okay. I mean, I listen to the stream all the time. I'm like a fairly chronically online person and I enjoy lots of dark things that I just also feel like wouldn't be just I they get overlooked and I I feel like I don't think I'm a very beautiful person but I'm conventionally attractive so I get put into a box so I end up going for guys that do treat me in like a, kind of an extreme way because then I and I didn't think I liked him and I tried what? to move on I like went on some normal dates with another guy and then I still was like thinking about him and I was like dang <laughs> Oh, is is this guy similar to you as you're describing? Is he kind of like you know, quote unquote, a basic bitch too? But he's kind of into dark stuff. No, a Chad. No, he's like he. No, he's like a nerdy emo boy. Okay, okay he's a nerdy emo boy. I mean, you know, that, that's that's fine. <laughs> okay, all right, here, here's the most important thing. Okay, so this guy's taking you on weird dates. Like in in terms of a personal dynamic with him. Do you feel safe with him and around him? Does he put you off in any kind of weird way outside of like going on these odd little excursions? Like, you know, when you guys talk, do you feel like you can be open with him? Uh, you know, can you guys laugh together? Do you feel like you have a crush on him? Do you feel like he has a crush on you? Do you feel like he treats you nicely, you know, or, or you know, are there other red flags in a way? Because maybe just um, him or you and you are into I, dark stuff, right? I want to hear more about the actual relate, not like what's the relationship with the because, person. Because listen, as, as long as you have like healthy relationship foundations going on, being into dark stuff is okay. Yeah, you know, as long as there's not like any kind of mistreatment and right. there's openness and there's honesty there, like as long as that stuff is happening, you guys can be into as much weird dark shit as you want. So, so, so tell us about the the actual person himself and the relationship that you guys have. 
Well, I, over the break, I'm in college. So like over the winter break, I went home. I was having a pretty difficult time mentally. And I think okay. that he also struggles mentally. And my roommate and best friend are like, she's also struggling mentally. So it was kind of a lot. And I kind of went home and stepped away from all of it and was like, I don't know how I'm going to get better if I'm trying mm. to fix all these other people around me. Mm. And so I think that that's an issue currently is that I feel really enabled in my bad habits when I'm around these people, but they're also the people that I care about because I do feel like I care about them, especially my best friend. Um, mm -hmm. But I do. So, yeah, I have well, kind of distanced myself. What, what bad or destructive habits are you engaging um, in? When I, you're don't know, around I don't know people? how triggering I should okay. be on here. Okay. Okay, I don't so, want to so say anything yeah. to bigger people. So, so it's stuff that it is, is it stuff that you would characterize as being destructive to, to, to yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Like okay. it's not hurting other, it's not anything that is harming other people. It's like okay. just all like self. -stuff. And, and, and this, this guy also influences you in this way too, or just these friends that you're talking about? Well, I think with a particular instance of something that was, that I was really struggling with and still somewhat am, like he just knew about it and overlooked it. And then kind of the red flag that, I mean, obviously there were other red flags, but the red flag that made me kind of distance myself was that he like made jokes about it in front of other people oh, and like never talked good. to me about it. Like, that's not and he was the only one that yeah. really knew it was happening. R respect is a pretty pivotal thing in any relationship, be it platonic or romantic. And if he's sort of like, airing out your dirty laundry like that and then making light of it and sort of making you the butt of a joke like that's um that's pr that's that's a level of insensitivity that you shouldn't be subjecting yourself to yeah i think that i um if i get into the whole analysis of like my own brain and where i feel like this comes from is that like i don't know who my dad is and i had like a fairly absent mother and I feel like I, and I, my first ever real boyfriend was like abusive to the point mm. that then he tried to murder the girlfriend after me and went to jail. Like he was mm. insane. And I've just had consistently, I've chosen the wrong thing. And I don't even know how to look for the right thing if I've just been like, I don't know. Obviously these are red flags. Like I'm not stupid, yeah. mm. but at the same time, mm. I'm like, I, I don't know if it's that I deserve it or if it's a... I don't know any better, but I don't know how to overcome that. If you, if you feel comfortable saying so, how old are you? I'm 21. Okay. You're, you're, you're still at a pretty young age in terms of like understanding the dynamics of relationships. A lot of people don't even really know or understand what an ideal relationship or what a relationship that would be fulfilling to them looks like until they're in their mid to late twenties, thirties, honestly. If, if I'm being if I'm being real with you, you know, at this point, take solace in the fact that you are beginning to learn what is bad or what isn't working for you. Because as we were sort of saying earlier with, you know, a, a, an earlier caller, some people for whatever reasons that they do see the red flags and they stick in a relationship or they stick in a situation, even though they know it's bad, even though they know it's not good for them, even though they know it's toxic or heading to a bad place. Um, you know, it, it sounds like you're at least get, grabbing an understanding of that at the age that you are to the point where you're seeing these behaviors, you're seeing the way that you're being treated by this guy, by previous boyfriends, so on and so forth. And you're like, I don't like this. This isn't good. This is bad. You know, and that's and that's a good thing. Some people will experience that same behavior and be like, oh, well, you know, he didn't mean that, or uh, I'm trying to see the humanity in him, or, you know, the way that he uh, did this or this violent thing or this other thing was just a mistake. That's not the real him. That's the whatever. You know, it's like you're, you're, you're doing good by realizing this is bad for me. This is not a good thing. And I need to distance myself from it. That's good. That's good. Don't be hard on yourself for not knowing at the age of 21, like what, what's, what's an ideal relationship that would make me fulfilled and happy and work within my life be you're, you're not even established in what could potentially be your career yet. You know, it's like, you don't even know what an ideal life would look for you yet living independently, much less with someone else. So, you know, again, don't be hard on you for not 
knowing like, oh, well, what are the good things I need to find? You'll figure that out with time. You know, you'll figure that out with time as you meet and talk with more people and meet different people and have a variety of different experiences platonically and romantically. You'll find out, I like these kinds of interactions. I don't like these kinds of interactions. I like being uh, treated this way. I don't like being treated that way. You know, look up things like, uh, what are my love languages? What are the ways in which I feel like I express affection? Do you do it mostly through discussion, words, gifts, physical touch? Uh, you know, explore these things. Think about these things. But just know that all of this stuff is going to come with time. You know, don't be uh, upset that you don't know and understand all of it at 21. I'm almost 40, and I'm still getting a grasp of this stuff at my age. So give yourself time and be happy that you have escaped thus far a couple of situations that could have been a lot worse if you stuck with them you know be uh, uh f be be vigilant and trust in your ability to sniff out red flags when you see them and when you see them back off thank you that's all i like really needed to hear that yeah, and again, there's there's nothing wrong with like being into dark stuff or having experiences in your past that were traumatic and expressing that or, you know, um, uh, through either art or, you know, other, you know, experiences where it's like low stakes or whatever, because maybe you have a curiosity because of something that you've gone through. That's that's fine. That's healthy. That's normal. Lots of people have that. Um, you know, it's the, it's the other things, it's the type of treatment that you were describing. That's the bad thing, you know, the, the minimization, uh, or the made to be a joke of your experiences and your pain and so on and so forth. That that's what you don't want to have anything to do with. How you feeling Joe? I'm feeling somewhat relieved and validated. And also like, this is breaking the fourth wall in a way and great strange good good um hmm. yeah i think um I, I i liked everything you were saying man about how like you need to you well you need to um kind of like let yourself be okay with just learning these things by experience and not like beating yourself up about it especially i i it was sad to hear you say that you felt like you somehow deserved it yeah you know because that's that's not that's not true um and uh don't i don't i wouldn't beat yourself up about it because it's you're in you know, as you were saying man you know it's very much a learning process that's that's a common experience with people that experience prolonged bouts of either mistreatment or abuse or whatever because sometimes yeah. the only way you have to rationalize it is to think well i must have done something mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. because the thing is sometimes the truth which like it's just a really bad unfair thing that's happening to you is really difficult to contend with because maybe you're not at a point where you feel like you can change it or overcome it mm -hmm. you know be it maybe maybe you're a kid who's being mistreated by their parents and you know the the realization of coming to terms that your parents are actually horrible people is really hard and really tough because you can't do anything in that situation they're your parents they basically lord over you you know what i mean and there's a lot of other contexts where people feel like they're in a point of weakness where they can't overcome you know that sort of thing and and again you know i deserve it is, is a very common rationalization mm -hmm. for it um Joe, is there anything else that you want to say about this or to me or Anthony or the people of the computer before we go? I think I just want to say thank you so much for what you do, Gek. I listen to your stream like every day, practically. Yeah, because it's it good. definitely helps oh. take my mind off things. So thank you, thank guys. you I appreciate for that, that and getting me through some hard times. And can I ask to like wrap up since you asked Anthony, in the beginning, what's the most persistent thought on your mind? Oh, man. The most persistent thought on my mind question. is um, I knew it was going to flip on me at some point. Oh, uh, it's mainly about it's mainly the fact that um, time is fleeting and I'm uh, it's mainly it's mainly an ever constant evaluation of my entire life and how I'm spending my time. And um, if if it's good, if, if I should give up my uh, 
entire ego and go um, be naked on a beach and renounce all of my possessions and relationships and um, finding the balance between that and, you know, being very in the uh, in my own universe. I don't know if what I said made any sense, but that is the most persistent thought on my mind. No, that made sense. Just know that I think it would make me and a whole lot of other people really sad if you just disappeared one day. But you got to do what you got to do and what makes you happy. So I will be a gecko on the computer for as long as people are willing to watch me be a gecko. Right. You, you could eventually get to a point where you just broadcast from some kind of fortress of solitude. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> That'd be sad, though. Like, like a couple... <laughs> Like a, like a couple hours, you know, for for three streams a week, but then the rest of the time, what you're living in the forest. I mean, that, that's not a bad trade off. Well, I ideally now I'm just get on a tangent, but I ideally uh, I want to make more stuff where I'm out in the world. Got it. You know, like uh, I'm going on this crazy tour, and um, I like talking. I like I, I like talking to um, computer people but i also i really i in enjoy person, talking people. To, in person people 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 and i've enjoyed talking to you joe and i hope that you um um continue to you know navigate this the best that you can and you know feel good about yourself yeah have a beautiful night thank you for everything you as well thank you joe you know joe like with the previous caller with the the music stuff yeah um i i I feel like societally there's just way too much pressure on people to have everything figured out at a very young age. Yeah. Like by my mid twenties, I I better have this music thing figured out or right. I'm going to give up on it. Right. I feel really bad at 21 that I don't know what the ideal relationship looks like to me. Yeah. Like you're, you're never going to have everything figured out. No, you know, no. like it's, it's, it, there, there's, there's, rarely i don't know you know even at my age i don't know that many people even some who maybe from the outside you would look at them and say yeah that person's pretty established in their career mm -hmm. who internally they're like yeah i figured it all out i, I don't need to figure anything else out i have mm -hmm. it all handled mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like you know you're always going to be in a constant state of, of figuring it out as as long as you're growing as a person we, and so uh, just like as a final thought on that is you know it uh once i realized that because I was looking at my, I was just reading my journals, um, mm -hmm. and I realized that my pro, uh, every problem I had, uh, like four years ago or whatever, uh, f completely fixed those problems. Mm -hmm. Not every problem, but a lot of them. And now they, they just have been replaced. And so now I'm like, oh, that indicates to me that I will forever have problems. And I that uh, with that first realization of that kind of scared me but now i'm like oh well if i'm gonna have problems forever then that means i don't need to worry about them because there's there's no there's no there's nothing to do about that mm -hmm. solving them won't solve them in a mm -hmm. strange way mm -hmm. um mr anthony fantano how tell me before we go before we wrap this all up what did you did, did you learn anything today what is your what do you make of the calls we've been talking to people on the phone, how long have we been talking to people on the phone for? Nearly three and a half hours. Wow. Do you have any final thoughts, sentiments about the themes of anything? I'll just, I'll let you, I'll I, let you talk. I, I, I love coming on here and helping people. It was fun. That, that's, that's what I was most excited to do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you were able to come on this, man. And you were a natural and everyone loved you. And I, and I, 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 I was, um, it's nice that I can really hear in the people's voices that, um, you know, what the stuff that you were saying got through to them and that this is really cool. Yeah. And, and that they love what you do. I mean, I wouldn't be here doing this if not for the fact that you, I feel ridiculous saying that because I'm in a gecko costume, Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> it's, you get it's, used I, to I, it. I wouldn't be here if you didn't build this thing. So it's, um, it's all, it's all you buddy. I appreciate that, man. And thanks. I'm glad you actually listened to. The, I'm stoked that you actually listened to the podcast. Yeah, I, lo I love the podcast. Hell, I'm glad, man. Thank you. I've recommended numerous friends of mine the podcast or made them listen to it with me. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. I'm a fan. I'm stoked. Thanks, man. 
I gotta check out more of your stuff. You don't have to, but it, only if you want to. Anthony, man, thank you very much for coming on. I really Thanks appreciate it. Thanks for having it. me on. I appreciate it. Uh, folks, Gek, bless you all. Thank you very much for coming. Um, check out Anthony. Ant- if you don't already know Anthony Fantano, he's a prolific musical critic. That's he right. has a YouTube channel called The Needle Drop. That's right. Go check that out. Music reviews all the time. And um, live life, do things, and um, peace be with you. Gek bless.